Flying in a plane nowadays is about as safe as catching a ride on a bus or commuting on the subway. Of course, that doesn't stop people being afraid of flying. To some, the prospect of long-haul flights or feeling the shudder of turbulence are reasons to avoid planes altogether. And then, every year, there are stories of downed flights or those that go missing, all adding fuel to that aviophobia fire. Take, for example, the infamous Bermuda Triangle, that well-known region of the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. What does that have to do with the fear of flying? Well, famously, a high number of aircraft are believed to have mysteriously vanished while flying over the Bermuda Triangle, their wreckage and passengers rarely ever recovered. Stories like that are enough to make anyone think twice about setting foot in a plane again. And then, there's SCP-787. As you may have already guessed, SCP-787 is a plane. Specifically, it is a Boeing 747-200, with a wingspan of nearly 200 feet and capable of seating over 800 passengers. The 747-200 is a part of the famous Boeing 747 family of aircraft. These are quad-engine commercial airliners, designed to be the safest ever built. The particular Boeing 747-200 that has since become known by the Foundation as SCP-787 is slightly different from one that might take you from your nearest airport to your long-awaited vacation, though. For one, SCP-787 has no known date of manufacture and no call sign, both which a standard Boeing aircraft would be expected to have. Additionally, the plane's entire exterior has been repainted. Strangely, even the windows have been painted over, and the paint was still wet when SCP-787 was first discovered. As for the inner workings, all of SCP-787's mechanical components, including its turbines, engines, and landing gear, are in perfect working order with no signs of any damage. In fact, the SCP Foundation's researchers aren't even sure that SCP-787 has actually flown since its construction. The plane's machinery looks so pristine that they might be brand new, with no detectable signs of any previous use. However, inside the main body of the plane, it seems to be a different story. Anything not mechanical, like the carpets and seats, have decayed over time. Perhaps strangest of all is the cockpit. Both the pilot's and co-pilot's chairs have been replaced with two masses of computer components arranged to take the shape of two chairs. So what, you might be thinking. After all, SCP-787 is, for all intents and purposes, just an ordinary plane. Not enough to put you off flying, right? Nothing more than a Boeing with a few little things off about it, like some missing seats and decaying upholstery. Well, there's that. And then there's the over 500 dead bodies on board. In June 1987, this flight of the dead was discovered several kilometers outside of the city of Bremerton in Washington state. The SCP Foundation moved in, securing the plane and swiftly getting it into containment. Now kept within a Foundation hangar, the interior of SCP-787 is monitored for 24 hours a day. Surveillance cameras and microphones are located within the cockpit, passenger areas, and even the plane's baggage hold, with recorded footage and sound relayed back to the Foundation. The idea of a plane filled with cadavers is certainly unnerving, and more than a little creepy. But why the need for all the surveillance? After all, the bodies on board are all dead, right? Surely they're not going anywhere. Well, let's talk about those bodies. How would you expect someone to die when they are aboard a plane? Maybe they'd be thrown around during a crash landing. Or perhaps a sudden depressurization might cause the passengers to suffocate due to lack of oxygen. Under normal circumstances, you might be right. But SCP-787 is no ordinary plane, and the passengers on board were not killed in ways you might expect from any ordinary aircraft accident. Referred to by research staff as SCP-787-A specimens, the cadavers aboard this particular Boeing 747-200 all have dramatically different causes of death. Some of the specimens show signs of strangulation. Others seem to have starved or drowned. Other bodies on board have injuries like gunshot or stab wounds, while further corpses look to have died as a result of blunt force trauma. A few have even been exsanguinated, that is, completely drained of all of their blood. 
One commonality among all the specimens on board SCP-787 is that some form of mutilation has occurred. 23 passengers had their tongues removed, a further 73 were scalped, 230 had Cyrillic letters carved into their left hands, and almost 500 of the passengers had their fingertips removed. Let's recap what we have so far. First, there's the Boeing 747-200, found randomly sitting in a field. Second, it's filled with over 500 mutilated bodies. And third, each one appears to have died from a cause you wouldn't typically expect from an airline accident. Seems strange enough. But of course, then there's the apparitions and noises that manifest inside SCP-787, which is why the Foundation keeps the plane under round-the-clock surveillance so they can monitor any anomalous activity taking place aboard this flight of the dead. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter the plane during an anomalous occurrence have led to individuals being physically ejected from SCP-787, causing severe organ damage and internal bleeding for up to 72 hours. The anomalies that occur inside SCP-787 range from the presence of loud noises with no obvious source, to the manifestation of strange human-shaped entities within the plane. The first anomalous occurrence recorded within SCP-787 was in 1988, when the sound of a loud pounding was heard against the doors and windows of the plane's left side. Two years later, a male voice could be heard from the onboard bathroom, repeating a singular phrase over and over. Philosophers always run from the advanced thickening treatment. In 1993, the plane's in-flight entertainment system seemed to be activated by itself. The overhead screen showed a bizarre choice of in-flight movie. Colorless pictures of a deceased man, accompanied by a female voice reading a gynecology book in Czech. The same year, the longest lasting of the SCP-787 anomalies took place. This time, the plane's fastened seatbelt sign spent almost four hours flickering while the first 15 seconds of Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit played on a loop over the onboard speakers. It wasn't until 1997 that the first of the humanoid entities appeared aboard SCP-787. This figure was indistinct, lacking any discernible detail, little more than just a human shape standing in the aisles. Observed by the Foundation's surveillance equipment, the figure was seen removing an emergency oxygen supply and mask from seat H-43. It stood perfectly still, wearing the passenger's breathing mask for over two minutes before removing the mask and disappearing from the view of the cameras placed on board. The figure did not appear anywhere else inside the plane. Another figure appeared four years later in 2001, sitting in the mass of computer parts that made up the co-pilot's chair. This figure, much like its predecessor, was indistinct in its features. For almost four minutes, it sat in the cockpit of the Boeing 747-200, just whimpering softly. Then it lurched forward, vomiting all over the console in front of it, before quickly disappearing like the first figure. SCP personnel collected a sample of the vomit the entity left behind. After performing an analysis of the sample, research staff found traces of nitrous oxide, thorium, bird droppings, and three human fingernails. At present, the origin of these humanoid figures is still unknown. Could these entities be the souls of the dead passengers, trying to offer insight into what happened aboard this flight? Or perhaps these indistinct human-shaped creatures are the ones responsible for the deaths of SCP-787's passengers? The next anomaly within SCP-787 occurred in 2005 when a female voice was recorded speaking through the onboard speaker system. The voice said, For your comfort and enjoyment today, pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Do not leave your seat. Leave your seat. Please. Pancakes will now be served. Yay! Pancakes. Exactly what the relevance of pancakes are to a plane full of bodies is still under investigation by the SCP Foundation. Next, in 2007, the Boeing's overhead emergency air masks fell from the ceiling, only to be snatched back upwards. They continued deploying and retracting for 14 minutes, while the plane was simultaneously filled with the noise of screams. Finally, the only other notable anomaly took place a year later, when the onboard temperature with an SCP-787 dropped 33 degrees from 20 to minus 13 Celsius in a matter of seconds. By the late 2000s, the Foundation's researchers was having little luck understanding the nature of SCP-787's anomalies. Instead, they turned their attention to identifying the bodies of the deceased passengers on board. 
through the use of advanced forensics and population databases. These researchers attempted to determine where exactly these bodies had come from. Researchers still haven't determined if they all died on the plane, or if someone had exhumed them from graves before placing them aboard for some unknown reason. In fact, the answer was neither, and Foundation researchers discovered something that no one had expected. One of the passengers was still alive. To clarify, the body aboard SCP-787 was definitely still deceased, but researchers identified the cadaver as a retired optometrist from Atlanta, Georgia, who is still very much alive. Foundation agents found the man was simultaneously alive and well in his Atlanta home, but also dead on board the Boeing 747-200. The subject was interviewed by agents and had no prior knowledge of any incident taking place in June 1987 when SCP-787 was first discovered. Even more interestingly, he claimed that he never even set foot aboard an airplane, which his wife and son both confirmed to be true. So what does this mean? How could the same man have been alive in Georgia and dead aboard SCP-787? Perhaps the answer can be found in a surprising place. The plane's toilet. Or to be more specific, the place where the things flushed in the toilet go to. Examinations of the airplane's waste storage tank have revealed something very surprising. There was one more SCP-787-A specimen that had been overlooked. It is unknown just how he got in there, but researchers discovered the body of an Indian man who looked to be in his 30s. The man, who was wearing a three-piece suit, was found to be carrying a number of puzzling items, including a surgical mask and gloves an unloaded Beretta DT-10 shotgun, several cinnamon-flavored mints, a switchblade knife, an amulet that appears to depict the Eye of Horus, and a ticket stub for the Return of the Jedi with the number 92 written on the back. All of these objects seem to be completely random, and the Foundation has been unable to make sense of what they were doing on the man, or why his body does not seem to show the same state of decay as the rest of those found on board. There was one item that may hold some answers, though. For some reason, this man also possessed a copy of SCP-787's flight log. The log consisted of a series of coordinates, which were repeated 5,478 times. The coordinates point to a seemingly random spot in the Pacific Ocean, several hundred miles away from the infamous Pitcairn Islands, the island that the famous mutineers of the HMS Bounty settled after taking over the ship and leaving the captain adrift on the ocean. Is this location the secret to SCP-787? While none of this is confirmed nor denied by anyone at the SCP Foundation, one theory surrounding the area is that the location is another Bermuda Triangle-like location, one that contains some sort of temporal anomaly that unwitting planes fly through, only to find themselves displaced in time. Of course, the problem with this theory is that the man from Atlanta said he'd never been aboard a plane before. Or at least, not yet. It is entirely possible that SCP-787 is a plane that made a flight at some point in the not-too-distant future, only to arrive back in June 1987 by passing through a temporal breach in the area near the Pitcairn Islands. Sure, it might not explain what happened to everyone on board, but it could at least explain how SCP-787 arrived where and when it did. Every plane is fitted with a device that records flight data, in the event of a crash or other accident, known to most as the plane's black box, and researchers were able to uncover SCP-787s inside a compartment under one of the plane's seats. The recorder was found within a compartment filled with toxic asbestos and dried human blood. They hoped that perhaps it would contain some answers as to what exactly SCP-787 had come from and what had happened to its passengers. Sadly not. The flight data recorder contained no information besides one simple phrase, to be sorry. While an inexplicable mystery, SCP-787 is at least classified as a safe anomaly by the Foundation, seeing as it poses no realistic threat or shows signs of trying to break out of containment. The aircraft has only ever caused harm to anyone trying to enter during one of its sporadic anomalous events, but apart from that, it sits gathering dust in a hangar, just waiting for someone to crack its secrets. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a plane that's taking you to your South Pacific vacation, and the retired optometrist sitting next to you will remark that you're passing over the Pitcairn Islands, and you'll discover for yourself exactly what happened to SCP-787. Take a brief moment to think back to your younger years, spending long, tiresome hours trapped in a classroom, waiting to hear the noise of that final bell of the day. 
That sound meant freedom, the end of another grueling six hours at your desk, and the chance to get back to the warm sanctuary of home. If you were lucky, you might not have had to go far to get back to the safety and security of being in your parents' house. Living close enough to the school would mean you could easily walk home when the day was through. But your classmates? Well, they weren't all as lucky. Some of them had miles to travel, all the way across town even. Fortunately, though, the school bus would always be waiting outside at the end of each day, ready to take a gaggle of rowdy kids back home. And if you were one of those kids that had to take the bus, you'll know that the trip home after school was hardly a calm drive. Paper planes and spitballs firing from all directions, wads of chewing gum stuck to the undersides of seats, other kids all around you screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs. Still, it could be worse, right? No, trust us, it could be much, much worse than you can ever imagine. What if one day, the bus that picked you up from school wasn't a bus at all? What if instead, it was SCP-2086? Picture this, one day you get put in detention at school. Maybe you were disrupting a class or were caught spraying graffiti on the outside wall of the gym. Whatever the reason, we're sure you'll think it is unfair that you got held back after school, after everyone else had already gone home. But you do your time until finally you're told you can leave. Problem is, your house is on the other side of town, and you've already missed the bus. You make your way off the campus, down the nearest street. Maybe there's a city bus you can catch that'll get you back home. As you stroll away from your school, you realize that the nearest bus stop, the first one on the route home, seems to be further away than you remember it being. Must be just the exhaustion of a long day getting the better of you playing tricks on your mind. It's not like someone could move the bus stop, right? Finally reaching the stop, you notice lights coming down the street after a few moments of waiting quietly. A late bus, just like you hoped for. It pulls up to the next stop, the doors folding open to allow you on board. It's totally empty, save for the driver, but straight away you notice there's something odd about him. He seems drained of color. His movements are weird, more like a puppet on strings than an actual living, breathing human being. Now that you think about it, if it wasn't for the fact he was clearly moving, driving the bus, you might assume that he was a corpse. Then again, maybe he just had a long day too. Taking a seat, you try not to think about it and stare out of the window in boredom. You watch as the route takes you past stop after stop, all of them empty just like the bus itself. But then something unexpected happens. You've ridden the bus to and from school so many times before that you can't help but notice when, for some reason, it takes a wrong turn. Looking out the window, you know you aren't mistaken. The driver has changed direction. Instead of heading towards the nearest stop to home, he's taken the bus towards the furthest edge of town. Desperately, you try yelling at him, asking why he's taken the wrong turn, but the driver stays still, as if he can't even hear what you're saying. That's when you notice the smell. You didn't catch it before, but now it's all around you, filling the air inside the bus. It's almost like the scent of disinfectant. The bus now smells the same way a hospital does. But that's not all. The more you breathe it in, the more you feel yourself starting to get woozy, arms and legs getting heavier. Everything around you feels as if it's spinning uncontrollably. Out of the windows, you can just about make out the sight of a junkyard, blurring in and out of focus. It's meant to be abandoned, and yet you're sure you can see movement. Massive, indeterminate shapes shifting around in the dark. Finally, your vision goes dark and you fall unconscious onto the floor of the bus. Only, you were never on the bus to begin with. No, although you didn't know it, you were prey to something that just looked like a bus. SCP-2086. And now that it's caught you, you'll never see the light of day again. Now, SCP-2086 doesn't just refer to a single creature, not by a long shot. It is the designation given to an entire species of arthropods. Think lobsters, crabs, and spiders, or insects like centipedes and millipedes. Only much bigger. To the untrained eye, and depending on when you look, an instance of SCP-2086 will normally look like any ordinary public transport vehicle, of any make and model, or belonging to any company or transit authority. Usually, though, they look like regular old buses, at least while they're out foraging for food. When born, an SCP-2086 specimen will grow to full juvenile size within a week, 
usually weighing 200 kilograms or less. Full matured adult instances, however, can weigh approximately 17,000 kilograms. The adults are the ones that go out foraging, leaving the nest to collect food to then bring back to the juvenile SCP-2086s. And by food, we of course mean humans. While out on the roads, matured SCP-2086 creatures are practically identical to the auto vehicles that form their bodies. But the materials that this disguise is made from, the steel, plastic, wood, and glass, they're all actually comprised of specialized chitin, the kind of outer shell you'd find on most arthropods. But underneath that outer shell, that's where you'll find the real horror. Within the main chamber, beneath the flooring of the bus's long inner portion, is stored the pulsing, beating heart of an SCP-2086 specimen. And we don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. If you were to lift up the floorboards of one of these bus-like creatures, you'd see its heart, along with other vital organs like the creature's brain and stomach. What's more, the figure in the front seat that you thought was a living, breathing bus driver actually isn't living or breathing, not anymore. Preserved in a shell-like substance that the creature is able to produce, the driver is actually a human corpse, acting as a decoy for SCP-2086s. From within the bus body, fibrous appendages reach up into the corpse, almost like incredibly thin hairs. The creature can then use the cadaver essentially as a puppet, a puppet with a dead person's body. That's how an SCP-2086 is able to move its driver around, making it appear more lifelike so it can lure its prey aboard. Think of it like the bioluminescent light that an anglerfish uses to tempt unsuspecting fish into their jaws. Same principle, but with a dramatically different result when it comes to SCP-2086. But if you thought bus creatures with internal organs under the floor and dead meat puppets in the driver's seat weren't creepy enough, there's still much more to SCP-2086s than meets the eye. For example, when they aren't out foraging, the adult creatures can unravel the roof of their bus-shaped outer shell. Underneath is a pair of wings, large enough and strong enough to carry their entire 7,000 kilos of weight off the ground and up into the air. As for eyes, the headlights at the front are, in actual fact, bioluminescent optical organs, allowing the creatures to see their prey even in the dark. Still not horrifying enough? Well, would knowing about their legs help? The wheels underneath an SCP-2086 specimen are also capable of unraveling, forming long gray or black legs like those of a spider. Yes, these are bus creatures with wings and multi-jointed legs. These legs aren't just big, clumsy appendages either. Compared with other arthropods, SCP-2086s are able to use their limbs to perform surprisingly intricate actions and finer levels of manipulations. For instance, a number of specimens have been observed in the wild by the SCP Foundation building shelters out of any materials that they can find near their nesting ground. And where do they normally nest? Wherever there's plenty of scrap metal and hardly any people to notice them. Junkyards are the preferred habitats of SCP-2086s and where they will normally establish their colonies. While the juveniles remain within the confines of the colony, adult SCP-2086 specimens will leave to collect humans. Although on occasion, the younger specimens have been known to travel out from their nest and rearrange or relocate signposts for bus stops. They then place them in a route that leads them back towards their nesting ground. It's something worth remembering if your nearest bus stop ever seems to be a little further away from the school than usual. Afterward, the older specimens will travel along the route laid out by the juvenile SCP-2086s, picking up any human passengers that they find waiting at the relocated bus stops. They have to choose their moments wisely, with people boarding and disembarking from the bus usually every few stops. Once an SCP-2086 has as many humans on board as it can carry, with the certainty it won't lose any at the upcoming stop, it secretes a substance similar to chloroform. This fills the inner chamber of the bus, causing that noxious smell, like hospital disinfectant. The chloroform-like substance incapacitates all the passengers on board, rendering them unconscious and readying them to be taken back to the local SCP-2086 colony. Once the adult SCP-2086 has arrived at the junkyard, the juveniles will descend on it, Given their much, much smaller size, they will climb inside the mature specimen and forcibly remove each and every human passenger it is carrying within. Then comes the truly nasty part. 
feeding time. Each juvenile SCP-2086 will force their captive human through an orifice that is located under the front hood of their vehicle's shell. This sphincter, a circular formation of muscle that can expand and contract to perform a bodily function, is connected to where the steering wheel is found on an adult SCP-2086. The younger creatures will push their human prey through the sphincter, consuming them. Once this has occurred, those hairy appendages in the driver's seat will then latch onto the body of the now-dead human, piercing through their skin, winding up and around their bones. These are the same fibrous hairs used to puppet the deceased corpse and use it to lure others aboard the bus. But these appendages have another function their feeding tubes. They will drain every last drop of blood from the SCP-2086's prey until the body is little more than a husk, at which point the tubes inject a saline solution directly into the cadaver. Afterwards, the inside of the bus fills with that same substance that preserves the corpse, and the process is complete. As horrifying as these creatures are, one of the few upsides of SCP-2086s is that they don't live very long. Female specimens will reproduce after 8 days and produce 20 offspring after this point. Each of these newborns reaches full maturity and size in about a week. On average, SCP-2086s live for 12 to 15 days. Another net positive is, because of their short lifespans, an SCP-2086 specimen doesn't need to feed on a human more than once, as the nutrients it absorbs as a juvenile are enough to sustain it through adulthood. Once it has matured, an SCP-2086 will go out into the nearest city or town to forage for humans, providing food to the next generation. And so the cycle continues. In the future, rather than taking the bus, maybe it's safer to walk. It might mean the difference between you making it home or becoming food. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long-abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny 
to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to mission command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine. But they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members, with the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer. The team split into two groups of eight, and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the mirror dimension Site-81, while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. Once inside Site-81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute, across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime's Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, 
were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard, and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the mirror dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared. Death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers. I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch. Since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Timmy Mason. Like a lot of healthy 8-year-old boys, Timmy liked to go on little adventures in and around his neighborhood. And now that summer vacation had finally rolled around, he had more time than ever to explore. But during one particularly hot day, Timmy suddenly realized that he was exhausted. The heat was beginning to get to him, and he'd forgotten to pack a water bottle. All he had was a couple of dollars and a handful of quarters rattling around in his pocket. He was considering heading to a nearby corner store and purchasing a drink when he first heard the music. It was a tinny rendition of Pop Goes the Weasel playing in the distance. Underscored by the rumbling of an engine, Timmy's face lit up. This could only mean one thing an ice cream truck, just in time. He ran in the direction of the sounds, not wanting to miss out on the cool, sweet relief from the intense summer heat. But when the ice cream truck suddenly rounded a corner and came into view, 
Timmy felt a pang of anxiety. It didn't look like most of the ice cream trucks he had seen driving around his neighborhood in prior summers. It was shoddy, an older, more boxy model with peeling white paint. But it was so hot out that Timmy felt he couldn't afford to be picky if he wanted to cool off. The ice cream truck came to a noisy stop, and Timmy ran over. When he reached the side of the truck, he noticed some other strange details. There was no serving hatch in the back of the truck. The closest thing was a thin, dark groove cut into the driver's side door. A door that seemed almost drawn onto the side of the truck, rather than a door that looked like it could actually open. How could the driver get in? And adding to the strangeness, there was no menu on the truck either. Typically on your friendly neighborhood ice cream truck, you'd find a colorful collection of all the frozen treats you could buy, along with how much they'd cost you, but not here. Timmy gulped nervously. He knew something was wrong here, but for some reason, he couldn't seem to pull himself away. He cleared his throat, forced a polite smile, and said, Can I get a green popsicle, please? There was a strange rumbling noise inside the ice cream truck. Suddenly, the slot in the door opened a little wider, and a long green popsicle in a plastic wrapper emerged. It came with a small piece of paper, with $5.75 in loose, scratchy handwriting on it. Timmy regarded the note with suspicion, and said that he was sorry, but he didn't have $5.75. Something inside the truck began rumbling again, louder this time, more aggressive. While the truck growled from within, Timmy noticed something else was wrong. His popsicle was no ordinary popsicle. It was a dead snake, straightened out and frozen solid. Timmy screamed and dropped the so-called popsicle. He turned and began to run, but it was already too late. The slot behind him yawned open fully, and a rusty spring-loaded chain fired out like a harpoon. On the end of this chain was a large snapping bear trap, which quickly latched onto Timmy's left leg. The chain yanked and pulled him backwards, dragging him ever closer to the darkened crevice in the truck's door. Moments later, he was pulled inside and the hatch closed behind him. His screams were muffled, and then overpowered entirely by the rumbling within. Soon after, there was silence. And finally, the cheerful tune of Pop Goes the Weasel began to play once more. The truck drove away, prepared to serve its frozen delights to another child, somewhere, anywhere. Not long after Timmy was reported missing, another young boy bought a scoop of strawberry ice cream and a waffle cone from the same truck. The boy's mother was horrified to find that this alleged ice cream was full of what seemed like blood and raw meat. Lab tests later confirmed that this gory ice cream was a perfect genetic match for poor, missing Timmy Mason. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to get involved, seeing as mysterious, horrifying deaths like this one were often the first sign of an anomaly's presence in the area, and they were able to quickly track down and isolate the rogue ice cream truck. This wasn't especially difficult for the agents assigned to the case, since it literally announced its presence with loud, obnoxious music. While it was easy to find, the ice cream truck soon designated SCP-1386 did however prove to be more difficult to contain than they first imagined. When a mobile task force attempted to engage the truck in hopes of apprehending it, an ear-splitting siren began to blast from the truck's undercarriage. This caused catastrophic inner ear damage to everyone involved. Incidentally, it's now believed that the reason the ice cream truck engaged in this defensive behavior had nothing to do with the fact the mobile task force was armed, but rather because of what they weren't carrying. It appears that SCP-1386 doesn't turn on its siren because of danger, but when it detects that someone is approaching it who isn't carrying any money. Eventually, the Foundation was able to trick the ice cream truck into containment, luring it into a fake, walled-off neighborhood, where it could drive its rounds constantly without the risk of encountering civilians. All those who had previous encounters with the ice cream truck were given amnestic treatment, and SCP-1386 was finally, officially, contained. But while it had been taken off the streets, the Foundation's work was only just beginning. It was time for research to commence. The first key discoveries that aided in the investigation involved the factors that are required for SCP-1386 to even serve its subjects in the first place. As the previously mentioned mobile task force learned, you need to approach the truck with at least $20 in cash to be absolutely sure that it won't turn your ears inside out. The truck also proves to be extremely adept at reading human emotions, and refuses to serve anyone who doesn't appear happy. 
With these requirements now known, the Foundation felt prepared to finally make some orders. First, they sent in a pair of level 3 researchers. Each of them requested a delicious cookies and cream flavored smoothie. The truck pushed both smoothies out of the slot in its door, one marked with the letter M and the other with the letter G. A handwritten receipt with a price of $4.89 written on it. They paid the price and the transaction ended without incident. The smoothies were apparently pretty good, too. Next, one of the researchers returned, perhaps longing for another taste of SCP-1386's wonderful ice cream. This time, he requested a Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. The truck rumbled for a moment before dispensing what seemed to be a ham and cheese sandwich with slices of tomato. However, upon taking a bite out of the sandwich, the researcher found that this was actually just a perfect replica of a ham and cheese sandwich made from Neapolitan ice cream. The receipt released from the slot simply said, April Fools, before the truck drove away without even asking for any payment. The same researcher would return to the ice cream truck one more time, this time requesting a single scoop of vanilla ice cream in a waffle cone. It was provided to him without issue, and he happily paid the 72 cents the truck requested in return. The next test wouldn't go quite as swimmingly, by which we mean it caused a horrifying death. This time, a slightly more senior researcher wanted to perform a test on the ice cream truck. He asked for a peach-flavored push pop, which he received without issue. However, when he refused to pay the price, an admittedly steep $16, all hell broke loose. As he tried to walk away, the hatch opened a full six feet, releasing its large, rusty metal trap around the senior researcher. He was pulled into the truck, followed by a horrific rumbling noise. Not long after, the slot began to spew a stream of pink liquid for a solid five minutes before driving away. This pink puree was later proven to be a genetic match to the researcher. After this, the Foundation refused to allow any other researchers to interact with SCP-1386. Only D-Class personnel would be permitted to take part in the tests. In contrast to the senior researcher's horrifying death, the D-Class personnel seemed to get along extremely well with SCP-1386. The first D-Class asked for a cherry popsicle with nuts. The truck produced an unwrapped cherry popsicle with nuts embedded in the ice, along with a receipt reading, $2.20, your nuts. The D-Class chuckled as he read the receipt and paid the truck without incident. The second D-Class requested a more esoteric treat, a Caesar salad flavor popsicle. However, the ice cream truck isn't one to back down from a challenge. It produced an off-green popsicle that tasted like, quote, lightly dressed lettuce with a hint of croutons. The next D-Class ordered a dark chocolate fudge pop, but wasn't able to pay an exact change. He gave the truck $2 bills and was given a carefully wrapped package with a crude drawing of US currency on the front. When the package was opened, he saw that it contained the exact change he required down to the penny. He made an official request to the Foundation to keep the change, but his request was denied. The Foundation then pushed its D-Class personnel to ask for more complex constructions, just to see what SCP-1386 was capable of. The next D-Class asked for a Kinder Surprise Egg, the kind which are banned in the US due to their history as being a choking hazard. However, the ice cream truck didn't have a hard time constructing the egg, except this one was made out of ice cream rather than chocolate. It did seem beyond the truck's capability to create the toy inside, instead including a small piece of paper reading, I owe you one toy. The next interaction wasn't quite as cordial. The D-Class requested one cherry ice lolly, one cherry ice pop, one cherry popsicle, and one cherry-flavored drink, frozen. This resulted in the ice cream truck making a horrifying noise, described as being like someone skinning a cat in reverse. It then unceremoniously ejected the red ice, causing it to shatter on the ground before releasing a styrofoam cup filled with frozen green liquid. This liquid was shown to contain huge quantities of arsenic, but was thankfully impossible to drink, on account of the fact that its melting point is so high that it's impossible to liquefy with current technology. And our current knowledge of SCP-1386 testing ends with its strangest story of all. A nonverbal D-Class was instructed to write his order on a piece of paper to pass to the truck, in hopes of seeing if it would respond to written commands. A slot opened up in the door a few inches lower than the usual slot, and a thin, flesh-colored appendage slithered out. 
its hand a kind of two-fingered pincher. It took the note from the D-Class and gave him an ice cream cone in return. The D-Class was visibly disturbed by the hand, saying that it looked horrifying and smelled like death. He even refused to eat the ice cream, saying that he'd lost his appetite. But other D-Classes capable of verbal articulation did not report any strange occurrences with the hand. They said that they found the hand to look completely normal, and as time went on, they began to trust the ice cream truck with increasing devotion, while their mistrust in the disturbed, mute D-Class only grew. In the strangest twist of all, this D-Class was later found dead in his cell from strangulation. The D-Class was alone in his cell, and there were no signs of forced entry. Perhaps he should have enjoyed his ice cream while he still could. You know what they say, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. And no ice cream is more scream-worthy than the one served up by SCP-1386. It was November 20th, 2019, and the helicopter circled far above in the freezing wind of the Antarctic. SCP Foundation Site Director Jason Monroe looked down at the isolated, mm. above-ground facilities of Provisional Site 344-1. Something about this place made him nervous, edgy, and for good reason. Between 2003 and 2019, 29 mobile task force units and 73 members of D-Class personnel had gone missing here and never been found. Monroe thought he was here for a routine investigation into negligence and mismanagement, but little did he know, he was in for so much more. This is the story of SCP-5545 and one man's journey into his own worst nightmare, literally. But this nightmare began a long time ago, 300 years to be exact. And like most nightmares, it started as a dream. That dream was one of expansion. National powers across Europe wanted to be the first to conquer the globe and expand into new territories, and sent countless exploratory missions off into the unknown to achieve this goal. Any history book will tell you that the first outsiders to lay eyes upon the continent of Antarctica did so in 1820. The reality is that the first ones to get there actually landed in the late 1700s. The hapless explorers ventured into mainland Antarctica and made base camps, before searching and digging for any useful resources nearby. They came upon a strange discovery, a hallway hidden beneath the ice. Not a passage in the ice, but a true hallway, complete with light fixtures. The confused explorers ventured down into these impossible hallways, and for many of them, it would be the last thing they ever did. No matter how long they walked, it seemed like the hallways just kept going. As they continued to walk for hours, they hoped to find something, anything. And eventually, they did. They passed from these hallways into somewhere different altogether, and most of them were never heard from again. Those who did manage to escape often died or took their own lives soon after. Whatever it was they discovered down there, they didn't want to live with it on their minds. It's believed that over 70 colonial explorers disappeared or died this way, and that most who found these endless hallways beneath the Antarctic ice never returned. The multiple anomalous objects and phenomena that make up SCP-5545 came into the Foundation's hands several centuries later, on September 18, 2003, when during an expedition into the Antarctic, they too found the endless hallways. The Foundation built Provisional Site 344-1 around them, hoping to safely seal them off from any other unwitting Antarctic explorers or researchers. But there was something else lurking beneath the ice in Antarctica, something dangerous. The hallways were designated as SCP-5545-1 and were thought to be the extent of the anomalous activity at the site. But soon SCP-5545-2 was discovered, which resulted in the deaths of 16 researchers. So what exactly is 5545-2? It's an entity so volatile that even knowing about it is considered to be a containment breach. And, as a result, it's kept in Provisional Site 344-2. Unlike Site 344-1, 344-2 isn't a physical space. It's conceptual, accessible only through the endless hallways, created with the express purpose of keeping 5545-1 and 5545-2 separate. Why? Because whenever the two come into contact, the result is 5545-3, the network of endless hallways expanding. If they remained in contact, 
The hallways would continue to expand and the entire planet could be filled with endless hallways in just four to six hours. While the two are apart though, 5545-3 reverses, but it always would take just a few hours to throw the whole world into a chaos of infinite hallways. SCP-5545 has been given the classification safe. Wait, we're dealing with a mysterious and volatile anomaly that claimed a huge number of lives and still somehow eludes true Foundation understanding, yet the official SCP Foundation classification is safe? How could this be? Monroe was the director of Site-58 and was the definition of no-nonsense. Prior to taking the site director position, he was a decorated member of Mobile Task Force Ada-10 and helped contain numerous Keter-class anomalies. He'd been around the proverbial block when it came to anomalous activity, and something about SCP-5545 and the management of Provisional Site-344 seemed awfully suspicious to him. And he had questions. Like how such an unpredictable anomaly could be declared safe, and why had there been such a lapse of communication between the Foundation and Dr. Gabriel Reed, who'd been running the facility for the past two decades? And most of all, just what exactly was the mysterious SCP-5545-2? Monroe started to believe that something terrible had happened at the site, and Reed was covering it all up. But to find out for sure, he'd need to go to Antarctica and investigate it himself. Information about this supposedly safe anomaly was highly classified, those without O5 clearance could face termination for snooping. But that didn't scare Jason Monroe. He dealt with Ketters before. He could deal with this. Or so he thought. Monroe submitted a request and was granted unanimous approval by the O5 Council to travel to Provisional Site 344 and get to the bottom of this mystery. He took a chopper to the base soon after, armed with a concealed firearm and a hostile meme detector or HMD, to test whether the base and its staff had somehow fallen under a hazardous mimetic effect from SCP-5545. He'd find the answers, or die trying. The moment Monroe arrived, he couldn't help but notice the strange way the staff behaved. They seemed listless, almost oppressive. When he showed his credentials to a researcher, they simply said, SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. His request to see Dr. Reed that night was denied. Dr. Reed was busy, he was told. Wait until tomorrow. The next day, Dr. Monroe met with Dr. Reed, but the results of the meeting were underwhelming, to say the least. Just like the rest of the staff on the site, he seemed exhausted, as though he hadn't slept in days. His responses were quiet and evasive, and he refused to tell Monroe anything that wasn't in the official files already. Monroe ran the conversation through the HMD and found nothing out of the ordinary. What was going on here? Monroe was irritated, but not deterred. Nothing would stop him from finding out the truth. The next day, he flexed his O5 credentials and hacked into the base's security system. This gave him access to cameras around Site-344-1, but more importantly, there was a single camera inside the mysterious Site 344 2. Jackpot. But when he looked at it, the feed was an entirely black screen with the words SCP 5545 2 is contained in Site 344 2. The footage of the staff in 344 1 was equally mm -hmm. strange. The 18 employees on site all sat at computer banks, with nothing but static playing on their screens. Monroe kept digging, though, and was able to hack into the security footage of Dr. Reed's office. As he watched, he discovered a 15-minute period where Reed left the office each day. He could use this brief window to break in and collect more intel on SCP-5545-2. Monroe was so wrapped up in the investigation that he almost forgot the more immediate danger around him and nearly mm -hmm. wandered into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 by mistake. He made a note to be more careful in the future. His first attempt at breaking into Dr. Reed's office didn't produce many answers. One piece of evidence was a blurry picture of what looked like a mobile task force entering a 5545-1 hallway in the dark. Another was a spreadsheet featuring all the personnel, living or dead, who worked at the site, but one name and the details of whether this person was alive or dead was completely redacted. Anything particularly juicy was hidden behind O5 clearance. If Monroe wanted the answers, he needed to break through. That night, he had a horrific reoccurring nightmare, one that had plagued him since he joined MTF Eta 10. He dreamed that he was in a fancy dining room with a grand fireplace. The room was full of statues of men and women. The men looked angry, 
and the woman looked afraid. As he approached the fireplace, the ceiling extended infinitely up into the darkness. Suddenly, the zombie-like body of a teenage girl appears in the fireplace, hanging from a long thread. Her eyes look furious and full of rage, and Monroe somehow knows that he's the reason for her hate. When he steps into the fireplace in this dream, she attacks him. The two intertwine, and they burn forever. The one difference was that in this new iteration of the dream, he blinked upon entering the fireplace, and suddenly he was in the hallway. He awoke sure that something was terribly wrong here, but he couldn't give up now. The next day, Dr. Monroe broke into Reed's office and made a horrifying discovery. He found files indicating that Dr. Reed was knowingly sending mobile task forces and D-class personnel into the infinite hallways of 5545-1 to their doom. He also found evidence that Reed and the researchers had been spying on him, somehow intercepting copies of the notes he had been taking. That's when Dr. Reed entered the office and interrupted him. Monroe panicked and drew his weapon, holding the doctor at gunpoint. He was breaking so many Foundation rules, but right now, he feared for his life. The doctor seemed unbothered by Monroe's threats, though. He told Monroe that everything was going to plan, and that he should go back to his room. Monroe was becoming increasingly paranoid. He felt that at any moment, guards might burst in and execute him. Nothing about this place made sense. He worried he was going insane. Perhaps the only way to find answers was to go even deeper to risk it all and venture through the endless hallways to find SCP-5545-2 himself and finally discover what this thing actually was. Monroe left his room and stepped into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 that was located just across from his dorm. He found that it was a hallway like all the others on site, plain, concrete, worn of age, with simple light fixtures on the walls. He walked for hours, recording with a concealed device. The light suddenly went out, leaving him in complete darkness. When they flicked back on, he was in a very different environment. A grand, old carpeted hallway, the kind you'd see in an old mansion. He broke into a cold sweat. What was so familiar about this place? He kept walking, racked with terror, until this new hallway finally led him to the place he'd been seeking. Site 344-2, the domain of 5545-2. It was a large, poorly lit room, filled with grimacing statues and a large fireplace at the far end. It was the exact same room from Monroe's dream, with one horrifying difference. Monroe noticed a single white thread hanging down from the infinite ceiling, and when he looked up to find its source, he screamed. There were hundreds of bodies hanging and swinging from the ceiling above him, everyone who SCP-5545-2 had ever killed, including MTF members, D-class personnel, and even the colonial explorers from hundreds of years before. And all of them were him, every single one. They had his face, and there, hanging in the middle of the room at ground level, was the body of a teenage girl, the one from his dream. In that moment, he finally recognized her. She was the girl he killed, the first him, hundreds of years ago. Much like Monroe, you're probably wondering, what is going on here? Thanks to declassified communication between Dr. Reed and the O5 Council, we can tell you. Jason Monroe is a man who's been reincarnated hundreds of times over the last 300 years, ever since he murdered a teenage girl, a girl named Emily, his daughter. This murder sparked the existence of SCP-5545 as an eternally reoccurring punishment for his crimes. Since figuring this out, the Foundation has kept tabs on Monroe's reincarnations, whether they're MTF members, D-class personnel, or even site directors. They see to it that these reincarnations always find their way back to 5545-2 to take his punishment and prevent the infinite hallway expansion that threatens to destroy the world. It's a plan everyone is in on, everyone except him. But every time he enters that nightmare haunting room, it all comes rushing back. In that moment though, he knew his crime and he somehow knew how many times this punishment had unfolded for him. He now had two choices. Repent and accept the punishment again, or leave and activate 5545-3, potentially allowing the endless tunnels to expand across the world. Like his many predecessors, Monroe made the decent choice. He accepted his punishment and allowed his own string to coil around him as the lights in the room went off, one by one, leaving only darkness. Jason Monroe, 
That version of him, at least, was never seen again. But the SCP Foundation is already eyeing up his next reincarnation and preparing to let this twisted cycle play out all over again. You've just had a night of your life in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. You spend hours shooting craps, dancing in clubs, and eating more than your fill at the famous all-you-can-eat buffets. You're staggering back to your hotel room, high on life in the early hours of the morning when you notice something strange. A long, dark tunnel just off the side of the strip. You didn't notice it on the way in, perhaps because you were distracted by all the glitz, glamour, and hypnotic casino lights. You see the tunnel and your overstimulated mind feels drawn to it. You stumble in and start walking. During your walk, you can feel your bones cracking. They don't shatter like you've just been hit by a train. They shift. You feel the entire shape of you bending into something different, but it doesn't stop with your skeleton. Your organs start to feel strange, and then your skin. In the complete darkness of the tunnel, you have no idea what's going on, so you just keep walking. Eventually, you find your way into a lush green forest. It's beautiful, but it feels like it should be a million miles away from the arid desert of Nevada. You were only in the tunnel for a few minutes. What gives? Hello? You call out. Is anybody there? No answer. You explore further into this empty forest. Its trees are far as the eye can see, but no animals. That's when you see something that catches your eye. A puddle of crystal clear water. But it's not the puddle itself that draws your attention. It's what reflects back at you when you stare into it. At first, you can hardly believe it. But as you move your mouth in shock and the reflection moves its mouth too, it's suddenly all too real. You've been turned into a fox. An orange, bushy-tailed fox. You scream and bolt all the way back to the tunnel that led you here. You sprint through and feel your entire body changing once more. When you finally hit the wall of dry Vegas heat on the other side, you're human again. You breathe a sigh of relief and stumble back to your hotel room. The next day, you only vaguely remember what happened, and because you're not crazy, you assume it was just all a wild dream. What you just encountered is a Euclid-class SCP known as SCP-2746, a seemingly innocent tunnel near the Vegas Strip, which holds a portal to a fantastical world designated by the Foundation as SCP-2746-1. By the time the Foundation discovered and secured the SCP-2746 tunnel and began sending their field agents and researchers on fact-finding expeditions inside, the place was already a ghost town. A forested landmass approximately 111 kilometers in diameter, with no notable signs of life. The Foundation discovered that this place had a strange effect on people and animals who came in from our world. Humans who entered assumed the form of a random animal, but retained their intelligence and vocal cords, creating talking animals. Animals brought into 2746-1 retained their animalistic intelligence, but grew human-like vocal cords, allowing them to repeat simple phrases. Before the mass exodus or extinction event that left 2746-1 barren, the Foundation figured out that this place was populated by a whole civilization of intelligent animals, like something out of a fairy tale. These animals, through a mix of brains and magic, were able to leave written records and create impressive architecture, like homes and places of worship. Foundation researchers became fascinated with how exactly this society operated and what could have led to its sudden downfall. Thanks to a mix of advanced archaeology and records left behind by the creatures, this is what the Foundation determined. The society these talking, intelligent animals lived in was a kind of religious oligarchy, meaning power was consolidated by the few in the top social class. Society was divided into three segments, crafters, scholars, and honorables with the crafters being the most powerful members of society and honorables being the least powerful. The state-sponsored churches acted in worship of a being simply called the Maker, who fills a similar role to the Abrahamic God. The crafters, whose number totaled 13, were believed to be immortal and were responsible for building the majority of the culture and architecture found in 2746-1. The scholars acted as their wise assistants, and the Honorables were a mixed class of artists, carpenters, and artisans. It seemed that this culture had a pretty good thing going. No system of currency was ever invented, 
and the economy operated on a barter system. The Foundation believes that initially, the citizens of this world didn't need to eat to survive, and so only needed to barter for material goods. Though it's worth noting that the conditions of immortality only apply to natives of this region. People born on Earth but assuming animal forms while entering 2746-1 still need nutrition to survive. However, a great tragedy soon caused a fundamental shift in the balance of life and society within 2746-1. The Maker decided it wanted to test or punish its subjects with two major changes. First, humans would be forbidden from entering the domain. And second, the Maker now made the consumption of food necessary for continued survival and sanity. Nothing was ever the same. Because nobody had needed to eat prior to this, food stores had never been made, and the inhabitants had no agricultural knowledge that would allow them to easily mass-produce more. As a result, while the crafters and scholars were able to feed on fruits from luxurious private gardens, the honorables were forced to resort to eating each other, or other inhabitants of 2746-1. This began a bloody rift that split society from the top down. One half, led by the powerful crafters Sari and Suward, wanted to preserve society as it was and continue to worship the Maker. Sari took the form of a Flemish giant rabbit, and Suward appeared as a house cat. The opposition, led by former crafters Frederick and Agathos, with the reluctant help of a scholar named Clovis, wanted to get revenge on the Maker for all he'd done and kill him completely altering society. Don't be fooled by their appearances, though. Many of the inhabitants of 2746-1 were fiercely intelligent sorcerers, and the apocalyptic civil war they sparked came to be known to the Foundation as Event Nachash. Like many wars, there would be no real winners here, only survivors. And even then, not for long. It was a bloody and horrific war. All attempts at finding a diplomatic solution failed. Frederick and Agathos would not stop until they had the Maker's blood on their paws. In the end, though, they were defeated. And for their traitorous crimes, they were to be punished by Sari and Suward in horrific ways to make examples of them. Since neither could die, they were given fates worse than death instead. Frederick was up first. Before the war, he'd been a leader prized for his courage and ingenuity. He'd created something known as the Great Fire which provided the kingdom with light. For his so-called atrocities against the Maker, he was given the punishment of permanent crucifixion and relocation to a place known as the Underplane. His snout was cut off his face, and he was set permanently ablaze in a manner that would leave him forever suffering and would make him appear to look like a monster to all. Next went Agathos. She was Frederick's sister and was seen as the mastermind of many of their schemes. She would be forever encased in white clay and bled through her eyes until the sin drains from her. She's now a living, crying statue, existing in a state of permanent imprisonment for her part in the crimes against the Maker. Clovis, because her involvement in the coup was unwilling, was given a more minor punishment. One of her eyes was removed, and she was permanently placed in a broken human body, effectively banishing her from her home in 2746-1 forever. Though they may have won, things didn't end much better for Sari and Siwa. The civil war had fractured their world, and in the aftermath, the survivors chose to leave in hopes of finding a better life elsewhere. Sari and Siwa, though, felt partially responsible for everything that had happened, and so they decided to remain in their dying world. Before they themselves died, or perhaps moved on to different forms, leaving their animal bodies behind, they left a final note. It was from this note that the Foundation learned much of the story of SCP-2746. This may seem like a pretty open and shut case, another magical realm destroyed by tragedy and civil war, much like the land of fantasy in SCP-1762. But what's really bizarre here is that this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the stories of some of these key figures in the event Nachash. First, what became of the two rebels, Agathos and Frederick? Today, they're two parts of the feared and deadly SCP-1913. Frederick, now going by Freddy, is a nightmarish faceless fire demon in the form of a dog, slavishly devoted to the protection of his sister, Agathos, now known as Agatha. Still trapped in white clay, 
for leaking blood now deadly to the touch. Clovis is still believed to be in league with Agathos and Frederick, and may now be related to the sinister SCP-1903, a one-eyed rabbit-like human. But strangest of all is the possible truth behind Sari and Sewer, the two devotees to the Maker who remained in 2746-1 until their very last breath. In all likelihood, these two were once agents of the SCP Foundation's infamous Las Vegas branch. They took on these more animalistic forms after their deaths. Sari may have once been Agent Sarah Crowley, a Japanese-American woman who died in the line of duty in 1960. Seward was once Dr. Stuart Hayward, Crowley's partner, his new name acting as a kind of fusion of the first and last name he had in life. This is only the beginning of the animal-themed weirdness occurring around Site-45, the Foundation's Vegas branch. But this series of anomalies, collected under the term Pitch Haven, will have to wait for another video. After all, you know what they say, what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. Ever since we took those first steps out of the primordial soup, Mankind has long since looked to the night sky and dreamed of setting out among the stars. Space is, as it has been said, the final frontier, the vast inky void that, for all its perils, still holds a sense of wonder and calls us to venture out and explore the cosmos. The earliest missions of the space race during the 50s and 60s showed the people of Earth that, while it wasn't easy, the dream of achieving space travel was possible. And that dream, the willingness to chase it, is all you really need to get there. Well, that, plus a couple of friends and a Volkswagen microbus. For William, that dream of traveling away from Earth and up to the starry skies was inescapable. At 21, he was a guy like many others growing up in the 50s. His friends and family all thought of him as a bit of a beatnik who was in deep with a lot of hip counterculture types. William had even dabbled in a few alternative religious groups as well, most notably practices like the action of transcendental meditation, as well as the teachings of Meher Baba, an Indian spiritual leader who claimed to be God in human form. In other words, William would have been a full-blown hippie in the 60s if he'd only lived long enough to see them. Even now, the idea of taking a summer road trip with a small group of close friends isn't unheard of, and that's almost exactly what William had in mind during the summer of 1958 but with a few key differences. For one, this was set to be a one-way road trip, with zero plans for a return journey. And why? You guessed it. It was because William and his pals wanted to go to outer space. More specifically, they wanted to drive to space, to leave the world behind and cruise all the way out into the shining lights of the solar system. In March, William bought a brand new microbus, a Volkswagen Type 2 Samba bus after pooling money for a down payment with his three friends, Jerry, Sam, and Susan. Ask anyone nowadays to picture an old-school minivan, and they'd probably end up describing the exact same type of bus. What had spurred them to buy a bus in the hopes of traveling off-world in it? Well, the three had recently been excommunicated from the Fifth Church, a highly secretive New Age religion. Members of the church, or fifthists, are all about conformity and control. You may remember these eccentric folks from our video on SCP-3512, The More You Know. But William's intention of traveling to space seemed to conflict with the fifth church's beliefs, most likely on account of his free spirit defying a group whose two main hobbies were obsessing over patterns and mind control. The young man believed there was magic up there among the stars, and refused to work a boring 9 to 5 waiting for that magic to come down to Earth. So, with the help of Jerry, he began to work on modifying the bus. Heaven was up there, and according to William, it was waiting for its angels. It took about two months, but Jerry came through. The engine compartment and cabin of the microbus were now airtight, with the section near the rear doors transformed into an airlock. The windows were replaced with shatterproof acrylic, the outer surface treated to withstand any space debris. The gas tank had been replaced with technology decades ahead of its time, 
but the steering wheel, gear shift, handbrake, and pedals all functioned exactly the same. One look at the outer panels of the microbus would have told you what it was and where it was heading. The word Starmobile was spray painted on one side and the other Alpha Centauri or bust. The 4th of July rolled around and their Starmobile took flight. William, keeping a diary of their journey, referred to himself and his friends as the only four people in the universe who were truly free. Careening upwards at 82 miles per hour without any police to stop them, no longer restricted by mundane life on Earth, the group traveled higher and higher in their microbus. Their plan was to travel straight to Alpha Centauri, the closest star and planetary system to our own solar system. Thinking their journey would only last a few short weeks, William and his friends waved farewell to Earth. The bus had everything on board that these intergalactic travelers could possibly need, from bedrolls and pillows to sleep on, to enough dehydrated food to feed the four of them for three whole months in space. There was even room aboard the microbus for Susan's cat Millie, as well as all the comforts of home. William and his friends packed bongos, a guitar, and countless books. But this road trip wasn't just an aimless joyride out into the cosmos. The intrepid group had enough supplies with them, and enough ambition to set up the first off-world human colony. They'd packed a seed bank, containing hundreds if not thousands of varying seeds from a number of common domestic plants from Earth. On top of that, there were even frozen egg cells of domestic animals like cats and dogs and livestock such as cows and pigs. These embryos were all ready to be unfrozen and allowed to grow once the gang reached their destination. However, it didn't take long for problems to start arising. For one, the group quickly ran out of libations within the first five days of leaving Earth. Spirits were naturally dampened by the absence of spirits, but William tried to remain optimistic hoping to grow barley and concoct some homemade brew once they arrived at Alpha Centauri. But while the lack of ale and lager was an inconvenience, there was worse on the horizon. During a group sing-along, something collided with the Starmobile. Naturally, all aboard were rattled, and it was Jerry who stepped up to calm everyone, stating it was likely just space dust or debris. He opted to take a look outside and see if there had been any damage to the microbus. Donning a homemade spacesuit, Jerry left via the airlock at the rear of the bus and examined, finding no significant harm had been done. But as he was about to make his way back inside, something struck the Starmobile again. The force of it caused Jerry to lose his grip, sending him drifting out into space. William was the only one at the wheel of the bus, but had never learned to drive. Eventually, he was able to turn the Samba bus around, but it was too late. Jerry was dead, adrift in the cold vacuum. The loss overwhelmed the group, but hit Susan worst of all. She and Jerry had wanted to get married the moment they arrived at Alpha Centauri. William had even obtained a minister's license so he could officiate his friend's wedding that would now never happen. Three days later, Sam and William awoke to find Susan dead on the floor of the bus. The grief and sorrow had gotten too much for her. According to William's diary, she died of a broken heart. Drawing up his guitar and strumming Amazing Grace for his second dead friend, William watched as Sam let Susan's body drift out of the airlock. He wrote in his journal that he hoped she would find Jerry out there in space, and at least they would be together. By now, it had been well over 50 days since the Starmobile had left the safe confines of planet Earth. The group had suffered two tragic, heartbreaking casualties already, one by accident and one as a result of the first. And yet, William and Sam, the survivors, were still traveling even deeper into the dark void above, plotting their course to Alpha Centauri as best they could with the hand-drawn star charts they had brought with them. So far, their journey into space had begun with promise and optimism and was now fraught with dangers and obstacles and these were far from over. Slowly, William began to realize that it was taking much longer to reach their destination than he and Jerry had first anticipated. Alpha Centauri is roughly four and a half light years from Earth. Bear in mind that a single light year is equivalent to roughly six trillion miles. William was unsure if the microbus had been traveling in the right direction, or if it had even managed to miss the terminus of the journey. The charts Jerry had drawn were of little help. He had been the expert. The one who planned the trip and modified the Volkswagen Type 2 Samba bus for space travel. William was out of his depth. 
hurtling through the galaxy with little help from his passenger. To make matters worse, both William and Sam had started feeling unwell. Not just travel sick, as you might expect after spending a long ride in a microbus trundling through space. Their illness wasn't even caused by being trapped in the cramped space for such a long duration of time. Blotches had begun to appear all over their skin, and Sam had been having trouble eating. At random, even a tooth spontaneously fell out of his mouth. These aren't symptoms typical of space travel, though. Due to a severe lack of vitamin C in the food they had packed, the pair of them had developed scurvy. Just as it seemed like a trip to Alpha Centauri couldn't have been a bigger disaster, William awoke to see something out of the microbus window, something he had probably seen hundreds of times in his lifetime. But seeing it now filled him with dread. It was the moon, as in Earth's moon. They were barely close to Alpha Centauri, quickly realizing that they would never reach their destination on their current course due to their grievous errors in calculation. William did the only thing he could. He closed the curtains so that Sam couldn't see how big of a mistake they had made. Eventually, Millie crawled behind the sofa and died. Meanwhile, Sam stopped being able to keep his food down. Towards the end, he could barely so much as see or even sit. Every time he asked his friend if they had arrived yet, William would tell him that they would be there tomorrow. He couldn't bring himself to tell Sam the truth. Finally, Sam asked William to read to him a poem by Dylan Thomas called And Death Shall Have No Dominion. He was dead before William finished reading. Saddened and filled with remorse, William pushed the last of his friends out of the airlock, realizing that no one would be left to push him out whenever he eventually died. The final thought he recorded in his diary came after two whole months spent isolated and alone in space before William's death. The last thing he wrote was that the stars look so beautiful against the dark backdrop of the universe. In spite of the tragedy of his situation, so few others, especially from his time, would ever truly see them like this. Today, the bus is still drifting quietly through space. Now known as SCP-1958, it rests in the orbit of Mars, the withered remains of its driver still sitting at the wheel. William and his friends never made it to Alpha Centauri. In fact, it would have taken them almost 40 million years to reach it. They never saw their dream come to the ending that they had planned. Instead, William, Jerry, Sam, Susan, and Millie the Cat all died among the stars, driving their magic bus, their Starmobile, out into the unknown. For them, space, that final frontier, had a lot more finality to it. A crowded train of commuters, heading to their destination. But for one unlucky passenger, he's on his way to a very unexpected destination. He purchased his ticket the same way as he did every other day and had it punched by the conductor. But soon he started to get the impression that something was wrong. Very wrong. He felt like he needed to get off the train immediately. But every time he tried, he was blocked. Sometimes the exit out of his seat was blocked. Other times a crowd of passengers would be entering at the same exact time he tried to get off the train, preventing him from leaving until the door slid shut. As the train got closer to its final stop, his panic grew. Because today, this train wasn't taking him to work. It was taking him to the end of the line. SCP-342 is one of the most benign appearing objects known to the SCP Foundation and also one of the trickiest to find. That's because it's never exactly the same object twice. It's a ticket to any form of mass transit, usually taking the form of the type that's closest to wherever it manifests, though most of the time it appears as a train ticket to a crowded nearby hub. It was first discovered in Chicago in 1936, where its terrible powers became clear. But even though decades have passed, it hasn't changed at all. Because SCP-342 is a predator, and one that goes to great lengths to trap its prey. When it's picked up by an unsuspecting passenger, it will appear as whatever the most likely method of transportation is for the person to use. But if it remains on someone's person for an extended period without being used, it will start to change. 
When not being directly observed, usually tucked away in a wallet or pocket, it will shift into another form, one more likely to be used by the person holding it. And in this form, it's harmless, but it doesn't stay that way. When it's validated for transit by being stamped, torn, punched, or accepted by a conductor or driver and thrown away, it activates. And the unfortunate person who used it to board a vehicle has been snared in its web. As soon as they board and their ticket is taken, they become incapable of exiting the vehicle. It seems like things conspire to keep them on the vehicle until the very end of the line at which point the passenger vanishes mysteriously. But before they go, things get strange. Soon after boarding, the unlucky passenger finds themselves tormented by a bizarre series of symptoms. They start to see the sky as darker than it is, and they hear disturbing things. Ordinary messages from the conductor become menacing. They start to see other passengers and random objects as threats, and become terrified of any employees. As the journey continues, they sink into hopelessness and fear as they realize that there is no way off, and they become impossible to calm down. The end is always the same, but it's what SCP-342 does next that makes it a bigger threat. Shortly after it has completed this cycle and the passenger has vanished into thin air, SCP-342 regenerates whole as a ticket to the same form of mass transit in a nearby location, just waiting for someone to pick it up and begin the cycle again. Studies have shown that it cannot be distinguished from any other train ticket when on the loose, meaning that if it breaches containment, it can be near impossible to track down. During a past containment breach, it caused multiple disappearances around the New York City area over the course of six months before being contained again. Once they had it contained, though, the Foundation was determined to figure out its secrets. With no survivors to talk about their experience, the Foundation fell back on their most reliable source of experiments, D-Class personnel. Tests were begun, and a D-Class was given the ticket to use on a local bus. Agents were stationed at every bus stop to observe without interfering. At first, the D-Class seemed unaffected, but as the trip went on, it became clear he knew something was wrong. He paced up and down the aisles, stared out the window in horror, and eventually pounded on the windows in panic as the bus drove away from its last stop, the driver seemingly unaware that anyone was still on the bus. And then, as a strange mist filled the bus, which obscured the agent's vision, he was gone. Passengers who had been on the bus were interviewed, but most didn't notice anything, though many said they felt ill while riding the bus or were distracted. A surprising number said they felt like something was wrong but couldn't identify it. A pair of boys, however, reported more. They said that the D-Class tried to get off the bus multiple times. His attempts to ring the bell were ignored. The doors closed before he could exit, and he would get pushed to the back of the line. Even when he sat at the front of the bus, he was never able to make it out. When hypnotized to uncover repressed memories, one of the boys admitted that he saw passengers shove the unfortunate D-Class back, and ended by screaming that it seemed as if the bus swallowed him in the end. It was clear that to understand SCP-342 fully, the Foundation would need to investigate further. Another D-Class was assigned, this time to ride the subway using the Doom ticket. But he wouldn't be alone. Agent Strahan would be riding with him and would be taking notes throughout. The D-Class seemed to become angry as soon as he boarded, but then something strange happened. Agent Strahan and the D-Class were separated by a pair of security guards who seemed concerned that they, and only they, would not be too close on the train. Was the ticket manipulating the people around it? Agent Strom was able to get close enough to keep records on the D-Class's movements and interview him, and nothing unusual seemed to be happening to the man's body. But after the D-Class asked to leave the train and was denied, he became aggressive, swinging on the bars and acting like a monkey which led to Agent Strahm having to knock him unconscious and handcuffing him to a pole. Deciding that he gathered enough information, Agent Strahm decided to abort the mission and try to help the D-Class exit the train, but now found himself blocked by the crowd. Even when he raised his badge and claimed to be a U.S. Marshal, he was ignored. He would report later that he was pulled back, but he didn't think it was passengers doing it. Agent Strom had one last card to play. He handcuffed himself to the now panicked D-Class as they approached another station. As he attempted to exit the train, he was struck by passengers and his badge was knocked away. 
But when he asked them why they were acting the way he did, they all claimed to know nothing. It was clear they wouldn't be able to get off the train on their own. Four more agents were deployed to the train to extract the two, and they were accompanied by the leader of the whole project. It was time for Dr. Gunther to have his first encounter with SCP-342. The group of SCP agents was barely able to deter the crowd until one fired his weapon into the air. They were able to evacuate the subway of all other passengers and cordoned off the D-Class. An agent ordered the driver to stop the train, but he seemed to not understand. The train only finally stopped when the power was cut. At this point, they tried to extract the D-Class, but he seemed blocked from leaving by some sort of invisible wall. As they attempted to remove the wall near him from outside, the subway suddenly started again, the doors closing and leaving the agents and Dr. Gunther behind. SCP-342 would not be denied. Agents were unable to catch up to the train before it departed, and they were forced to race to the next stop. Crowds filed onto the train, and when the agents and the doctor were able to board, they found no trace of the D-Class or Agent Strom. It was expected that both were gone for good, but Agent Strom was found eight kilometers away, comatose, with his end of the handcuff still attached. But the other end was cut cleanly away, as if it had simply vanished, along with the man on the other end, only a few splatters of blood being all that remained of the unfortunate D-Class. The Foundation now knew that the effects of SCP-342 were inescapable, but they didn't know exactly what happened to its victims. Agent Strom, deeply disturbed by his close encounter, had to know the truth of what SCP-342 did to its victims. He volunteered to be the next test subject and would not be dissuaded. He was accompanied by two agents he was close to, along with Dr. Haber, on what he knew would likely be a one-way trip. He seemed strangely calm and curious as he embarked on his last ride, making no effort to leave, and refused to even try to exit the train when his supervisors encouraged him. But Dr. Haber insisted, and that's when everyone found out just how far SCP-342 would go to prevent interference. A homeless man suddenly lunged forward and attacked Dr. Haber with superhuman strength. The man was shot by Dr. Haber and Foundation agents waiting at the next stop, and removed the possessed man and the doctor for medical treatment, along with everyone else on the train. After the evacuation, Agent Aaron chose to remain alone with Agent Strom, and they took the last step of this strange journey together. As the train continued on, Aaron began seeing hallucinations, including odd shadows lurking around his vision. Strom remained calm, even as his visions got worse and worse. He saw Agent Aaron turning into a demon, and the train itself looking like it was melting. But things were about to get even stranger. It was the end of the line, and Agent Aaron felt the movement of the train stop. But Agent Strom believed the train was pulling away, and suddenly he began to move, pulled towards the front of the train and into the closed conductor's room, moving right through the solid metal. The last thing Agent Aaron saw was an unknown creature, a giant spider wrapping Agent Strom up and pulling him away. But the creature knew it wasn't alone. It turned to Agent Aaron and ordered him off the train. Agent Aaron was found at the back of the train in a panic, having gotten close to something no person had ever seen and lived to tell. This gave the Foundation their first clear idea of what SCP-342 might actually do. It seemed like those who held the ticket were forced to continue their ride beyond this realm, on a sort of shadow train, until they reached whatever this creature waiting for them was. Further experiments would focus on figuring out exactly how the ticket worked, and whether it could be tricked in any way. They discovered that the ticket didn't activate on private buses where the subject was the only passenger. It seemed to only interact with real transportation systems filled with commuters. Even when unsuspecting passengers were added and new drivers were hired, the ticket didn't activate, though drivers often seemed to be confused when used in this experiment. But further testing was needed to find out just what role the driver played in all of this. It was difficult to find a bus driver who would agree to the Foundation's terms, but one named Bucky Fallsworth signed on to manage the doomed ride. A D-Class with the ticket would board midway through his ride, and Fallsworth would then be switched out for an SCP agent who would finish driving the route. But things went terribly wrong. Rather than switch out at the appropriate spot, Fallsworth drove on. He became obsessed with driving the bus to its destination, stopping for nothing, even killing a pedestrian in the process. 
and ultimately had to be taken out by a sniper's bullet. In the aftermath, some bodies were never found including the unfortunate D-Class used as a subject. Not dissuaded by their disastrous results, agents would try this experiment again, but this time with subway trains. There would be multiple trains, some driven by agents of the Foundation who could control the route, but invariably the ticket-bearing test subjects would find themselves on the unsafe trains driven by civilians. The same effect that conspired to keep them on the train conspired to get them on. And tragically, in one attempt to get a subject off the train, Dr. Haber was caught in the door and killed when his head hit a stone ledge. After this, it was determined that future experiments were too dangerous. The Foundation was finally done with SCP-342, but the ticket wasn't done with them. Dr. Johannes Gertrum was the first to fall prey to the ticket's persistence. The subject of an early experiment where he tore the ticket but never got on the bus, he lasted a year and retreated to an on-site safe zone where he chronicled his experiences. He was haunted and obsessed with thoughts of the train, developed a fear of roads, and spent weeks working in his office to avoid going home. His behavior became increasingly unstable, and after being dismissed from the office and put on house arrest, it's believed he slipped out of his house and boarded a bus one morning, finally accepting his fate and letting SCP-342 claim him. The ticket has not been used since experiments were discontinued, and was only taken out of storage for archiving by Dr. Gunster and Dr. Clef. They examined it, discussed the failed experiments, and then left for their evening plans seeing a musical at a nearby theater. As the night went on, Dr. Gunster seemed to become more and more disturbed. While sitting at a bar after the show, Dr. Gunster told Dr. Clef that it was time for him to leave, and handed Dr. Clef an envelope before getting into the taxi. Dr. Clef looked inside the envelope, and he saw that it contained two identical tickets for Dr. Gunster's seat at the theater. As Dr. Clef approached a trendy bar with a $20 cover charge, he checked the envelope again and found that the second ticket had turned into a $20 bill. Dr. Clef raced back Whoa. to the spot where Dr. Gunster had boarded the taxi, but the scientist had already driven off down an alleyway that terminated in a dead end. Dr. Gunster was hmm. never seen again. The ticket had displayed a new ability. It could become something completely different. Currently, SCP-342 is safely contained and poses no risk as long as it is not used. It is stored in an envelope and stapled to the inside. Experiments with SCP-342 are forbidden, but given that the ticket to ride has shown a unique ability to compel people to take actions that will bring them into its trap, and that it has evolved to take on new forms, caution is warranted. The Foundation advises anyone taking a ticket on mass transit to know exactly where their ticket comes from, or they might find themselves taking a much longer trip into the unknown. Not everything in this world is exactly as it seems. In fact, there are many creatures in the wild that go out of their way to be deceptive, to disguise themselves as something entirely different from their true nature. Aggressive mimicry refers to a phenomenon in which predators or parasites take on the appearance of something harmless or even appealing in order to lure in their intended prey or host without detection. They might resemble food, an inanimate part of the environment, or even a potential mate. Whatever they choose, they're secretly a wolf in sheep's clothing. In the deep, dark waters of the ocean, the anglerfish dangles an alluring light from its head ushering in little fish that it can trap in its mouth and devour whole. The alligator snapping turtle wiggles its long tongue like a worm, attracting hungry fish looking for their next meal. Instead, they become the meal for something bigger and more clever than them. False cleaner fish share their appearance of another species, one that helps clean larger fish in a symbiotic relationship. When the imposters find a victim, they swim close under the pretense of cleaning, only to take a bite out of them and swim away. Predators use similar illusions on land too. Anti-mimicking jumping spiders wave their false antenna in the air in an imitation of an ant's movements, isolating the insects from their colony before dragging them back to their lair to be devoured. The mouthparts of the male spiders are shaped like the head of an ant, but this imitation head splits apart to reveal the spider's fangs and its true intentions. The Photorus firefly lights up its body in a mimicry of other firefly species' mating signals, signaling male fireflies looking for companionship. 
When they respond to the call, however, they will not find a willing mate waiting, but instead a femme fatale of a firefly that just wants to eat. The spider-tailed horned viper has a bulbous tip on its tail, with false legs jutting out on either side. As the snake wiggles its tail, running it across the ground while the rest of its body lies in wait just out of sight, a hungry bird spots it from above. When the bird swoops down to seize the opportunity, the snake reveals itself, snapping up the unfortunate bird before it can escape. Thankfully, humans are so much smarter and more observant than fish, ants, and birds. We're safe from that sort of trickery. There aren't any animals out there who've learned how to look like something familiar, something every day, just to put unsuspecting people at ease and lure us into its waiting jaws. Right? Wrong. Only a couple of years ago, the SCP Foundation discovered a being that has mastered aggressive mimicry on a level previously unseen in the natural world. Unfortunately for us, its prey of choice happens to be humans, and its hunting ground is the very cities where we like to think we're safe from something much bigger, meaner, and hungrier than us. A short video went viral on a popular social media platform. The specific platform has been redacted from official files, but the details of it are clear. A popular creator on the app, a young woman known for her makeup tutorials and restaurant recommendations around her native city of Los Angeles. She was live streaming and answering questions while going about her day when she stepped onto a train at one of the metro stations around the city. The train was extremely crowded, and she was preparing to end the live video, planning to resume once she reached her destination. But just as she went to press the button at the end of the stream, something strange happened. The train went dark, and the space flooded with a strange, thick liquid. The girl screamed in either pain, horror, or both, and dropped the phone. Whatever it fell into must have degraded the phone at an extremely rapid pace because the video feed cut out immediately after a splash. All across social media, people shared the video with one question in mind. What happened on that train? Fans mounted a campaign to find the influencer, to help her if she was in any immediate danger, but there were no leads. Her friends and family said she never came home that day, and when authorities attempted to trace her phone, they could not get any kind of signal. Becoming increasingly concerned about this missing girl and the possibility of some kind of unreported train accident, authorities contacted the Los Angeles Metro and showed them the video footage. But every train was accounted for and in pristine condition. There had been no strange chemical leaks, no crashes, and certainly nothing like what the video appeared to show. At the same time, there were missing persons reports being filed all across the country, in every area with a thriving public transportation system. Not only were the occupants of the Los Angeles train unaccounted for, with no wreckage or bodies to be found, but people were disappearing in train stations in New York, Boston, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and more. A woman reported her husband missing after he called her to check in during his daily commute home from work. The train had kept going for much longer than it ordinarily did, drifting off of its usual route. He told her that something was wrong, that he had a terrible feeling of foreboding, and then the call cut off. He never made it home for dinner. A young woman was on her way to start an internship at a prestigious New York City magazine, but never arrived for her first meeting. When her would-be boss reached out to the girl's roommate, all he knew was that she had planned to take the train to work that morning. A private detective trailing a man's wife for him, looking for evidence of an affair, lost track of her when she stepped onto a train downtown. He took the next train, hoping to catch her at what he assumed would be her stop, but she never got off. He wasn't able to track her down, and had to give her suspicious husband the news that his wife had somehow vanished into thin air. It wasn't just one or two people every so often, either. Entire train cars of people were just disappearing, never to be seen again. No matter how hard anyone tried, they could not find any answers. No logical explanation for what could have happened. Fortunately, the video circulated so widely that it made it onto the feed of an SCP Foundation employee who was idly scrolling during a bathroom break. He was so shocked by what he saw that he almost forgot to pull up his pants before running out into the hall. Fortunately, he did remember and rushed to his supervisor's office fully clothed. After determining that the video was not a hoax or some kind of viral marketing stunt intended to sell a new brand of spicy chips, the SCP Foundation decided to launch a formal investigation into anomalous activity involving trains and subway systems around the country. Task forces were set up in every major city, 
and field researchers were assigned to take the train all day every day as much as possible. As they did, they would maintain communication with the head of their task force, would monitor their findings via hidden cameras and microphones. A week passed without incident, and the Foundation was starting to wonder if somehow the Los Angeles video had been faked when the Chicago task force made a harrowing discovery. Officer Jamie Bauer was assigned to monitor the trains on Chicago's Blue Line, taking the train throughout the day and keeping an eye out for suspicious or potentially anomalous activity. One week in, and he pretty much had it down to a basic routine. He would grab breakfast, hop on the train, and enjoy his coffee and meal while reading a book and riding the train to its last stop. Then he'd pick up lunch and do the same thing all over again. He'd have dinner and repeat. It wasn't too exciting, but then again, excitement in this case probably meant horrors beyond his comprehension. So he was perfectly fine with traversing the city in a subway car and catching up on the backlog of murder mysteries he'd been meaning to read. It was Monday afternoon. He'd picked up a slice of deep dish pizza, excited to try it for the first time, and walked down into the metro station as he took his first bite. Can you try not to chew into your microphone, please? It's gross. Dr. Susan Shepard, the head of the Chicago Task Force, spoke into Jamie's earpiece. You got it, boss, he said, his mouth full. Thanks. See anything unusual today? She asked. You tell me, you can see the video feed, right? He took another bite, chewing as quietly as he could. Sure, but you're on the ground. Just keep an eye out, okay? Be careful. Remember to draw your weapon if something goes south. Don't just disappear into your book and forget to keep your wits about you. Dr. Shepard sighed. Yep, getting on the train now. Not gonna talk much so these folks don't think I'm nuts. Jamie waited for the doors to open. And just for a moment, noticed that they seemed to stick just a little this time. Nothing to be too worried about, though. Everything looked normal, just as it had on every other ride he'd taken. He could feel the Agatha Christie book calling to him from inside of his tote bag, and he wanted to crack it open and see what clues Hercule Poirot had come across. But Dr. Shepard was right. He'd been slacking off. He needed to pay attention to his surroundings. So he did just that. He watched as the train car steadily filled up with passengers, college students with bags full of books and exhausted expressions, middle-aged people in business attire, tourists wearing souvenir baseball caps and snapping pictures of everything in sight. Before too long, the train was completely packed, and Jamie could barely move without bumping elbows with someone. It was a little claustrophobic, but that was public transportation. Jamie leaned back in his seat, pulled his book out, and focused on the comforting rumble of the engine, the rhythm of the wheels on the tracks. Suddenly, without warning, the train screeched to a stop. They were in the middle of a tunnel, Jamie assumed, from the darkness that flanked them out the window on either side. Wait, was it dark? Or had the windows just disappeared? He squinted through the blackness and tried to see what was outside, but he couldn't make sense of his surroundings. All around, the other passengers were becoming restless, nervous. Some were calling for help. Others were just complaining. Doc, you seeing this? Jamie hissed into the microphone. I don't see a thing, Dr. Shepard replied. Are you all right? Fine, the train's just stalled. I don't know where or what's wrong with it. Jamie began feeling along the walls of the train, looking for doors. Huh, that's weird. What? Well, the crack in the doors, when they come together, should be right here, but it's all smooth. No gaps or anything, like it's all one thing and it feels strange, like... He cut himself off as his stomach dropped, a sudden rush of fear flooding his senses. Like what? Dr. Shepard pressed. Like it's alive, Jamie said shakily. Campbell, what's happening in there? Dr. Shepard began taking furious notes on her hand. I don't know, it's so dark. Everyone's scared, I'm scared. I don't think this is a train. I don't know what it is, but... It's nothing good. As Jamie felt around, he smelled something sour, foul, and sharp in his nose. He heard liquid splashing onto the ground, the sound of something sizzling, and then people started to scream. As he felt along the wall, something dripped onto his hand, and then it started to burn. He cried out in agony as whatever had dripped onto him ate away at the skin, dissolving his hand bit by bit. What is it? Dr. Shepard's voice shook as she heard the pain in Jamie's voice. Some kind of acid! Oh god, it's everywhere, it's on the walls, the floors, it just keeps coming. He trailed off. Oh god, oh god, we're in his stomach, whatever this thing is, it's eating us! Campbell, you need to get out of there right now, Dr. Shepard ordered. Draw your weapon, whatever you need to do, just get out! Jamie pulled out his weapon and started firing at the place where the door should be. But the bullets bounced off uselessly, as if the fleshy material was the side of a tank. He fired until there was no more ammunition left. 
and then he just kept squeezing the trigger some more out of pure survival instinct. But all it got him was a useless click, and the certainty that the one thing he had brought with him in case of emergency was completely useless. All the while the acid was creeping higher, dripping from every surface, filling the train car until it swallowed the cries for help and the screams of fear and agony. All Dr. Shepard could do was listen helpless as Jamie and the rest of the passengers were digested inside of the massive stomach. What happened to Officer Jamie Campbell was tragic, but it provided important information that the Foundation would likely never have gotten otherwise. They now knew a few key things about this new anomaly. It was some kind of living thing able to disguise itself as a train. It was resilient to bullets and firearms, and it was hiding in plain sight in order to hunt human beings. They had found the culprit for the rash of mysterious disappearances, and it was a race of unidentified creatures capable of taking on the shape of a common underground train. The newfound information quickly circulated throughout the Foundation, making its way to the various task forces assigned to Operation Metro, as it had been unofficially nicknamed. Task force members were no longer instructed to board trains. Instead, they would slip hidden cameras onto as many train cars as they possibly could, each outfitted with a tracking device. Then the Foundation could remotely monitor the trains for any potential signs of the mysterious creatures, looking for imposters masquerading as trains, without unnecessarily losing any more operatives in action. Now, as for what they would do once they found one of these massive creatures was still uncertain, but at least they had somewhere to start. The SCP Foundation tried and failed to contain several instances of the carnivorous species before they finally got it right. They attempted to freeze the inside of one train with liquid nitrogen, hoping to incapacitate the creature before it could feed, defend itself, or escape custody. The extreme cold seemed to have no effect, however, and the false train slammed its doors shut at the first sign of discomfort, then sped away at high speed. As it did, the task force members noticed that, though they could hear the sound of wheels on the tracks, they could see legs jutting out of the bottom of the creature, scuttling along the ground. Next, they attempted to take out the creature's legs and render it immobile so that it could be subdued. The legs were resilient to external damage, becoming hard as a rock whenever any weapon, blade, or other implement made contact with them. One task force member tried to physically hold some of the legs in place, but they shifted their shape, becoming appendages resembling tentacles, and threw the man out of the way before the false train hurried out of the tunnel and out of sight. They were then able to track down a predatory train just after a feeding, when it was slightly sluggish after a large meal. They pumped an aerosolized poison into the train's interior, the belly of the beast, potent enough to take out a dinosaur, and were relieved to find that the creature was unable to flee. Unfortunately, though they were able to subdue the creature, they killed it in the process. At first, they assumed it was just inactive, but it never resumed activity again. It was just like an ordinary train car, almost. When the interior was touched, it felt warm and slightly pliable, less like metal and plastic, and more like flesh. The longer the creature was still, the more the windows on the side stopped looking like windows and started looking like wide, glassy eyes. The front of the train became a gaping maw, the silhouette of the conductor inside revealed as an extension of the creature's body, resembling a tongue. Survivors and witnesses were given an amnestic to remove any memories of the supposed killer trains running under their city, and the Foundation prepared to bring the dead specimen in for further study. A cover story was used involving massive repairs to the train system, and while the tunnels were closed off, they managed to remove the creature and transport it to a nearby Foundation containment site. There it was given one of the most extensive autopsies in Foundation history, and the first one conducted largely from inside the subject. The autopsy provided a more in-depth look at the nature of the bizarre creature and its curious nature. The creature, nicknamed the Train Eater, referring to its preferred disguise and favorite activity, was one of an apparent species of carnivorous predators that used shape-shifting and an advanced form of aggressive mimicry to prey on commuters, tourists, and anyone else in need of a ride from one place to the next. It would mimic the shape, feel, and sounds of a train, welcoming unassuming victims into its stomach, and once it was completely full and able to efficiently feed, it would release an incredibly potent stomach acid into the compartment and quickly dissolve everything inside. The creature was highly adaptable, able to harden parts of its body at will and display extreme resilience to weapons of any kind. Due to this nearly impenetrable flesh, 
Victims trapped inside would be unable to force their way out. As the research staff turned in their autopsy results and official report, there was a sense of unease in the air as everyone wondered how many of these things are out there, which innocent trip to work might be their last, and how on earth could they hope to contain something that could exist in endless numbers, something so expert at hiding in plain sight. There was no realistic way to bring all these creatures into custody, and so they would have to neutralize as many as possible without being detected. Foundation operatives embedded in various city and state governments introduced new measures to renovate public transportation systems, including new sanitation protocols. As part of these protocols, all trains would be sprayed with a high-strength disinfectant before they could be certified for use. In reality, this disinfectant would be the same poison used to take down the first train eater the Foundation studied. Once any and all potent threats had been rendered harmless, trains that were found to be formerly living would be converted into fully functioning trains and allowed to run as normal in order to avoid unnecessary interruptions to the public. In addition to these containment measures, the Foundation monitors all social media for mentions of unusual activity on trains or mentions of any more missing persons lost at metro stations. The original Los Angeles video that started it all was scrubbed from the internet entirely. So by all means, take advantage of your local public transportation options, but remain vigilant and keep your wits about you. And remember, next time you travel by train, if you see something, say something. More specifically, if you see something unusual on a train, if it looks a little different than it did yesterday, if its sounds don't seem quite right, make sure to let everyone around you know that it is not safe to be here and quickly make your way to the exit. Then, maybe walk to your destination instead. It might make you a little bit late, but hey, better late than dinner. We all have fond memories of the playground. Hours upon hours spent in blissful childhood abandon, racing around the local park climbing the monkey bars, and seeing if you could get even higher on the swings than your best friend. And then, of course, there's the slide. Who doesn't love a slide? Only you and the force of gravity pulling you down through a straight or spiral tube. Those few seconds of excitement, that rush of not knowing whether you'll come out the other end of the slide or not, that's enough of a thrill for any kid. Of course, you would always come tumbling out of the mouth of the slide every time, at worst with an odd but innocent friction burn on your leg or arm. But what if, one day, you didn't come out of the other end? Or worse, what if the place at the end of the slide wasn't the world you left behind when you slid through the entrance? It doesn't seem all that likely to happen, right? Well, you've obviously never taken a trip down SCP-1562, better known as the Tunnel Slide. As its moniker suggests, SCP-1562 is a slide, or it at least appears to be an ordinary tunnel slide. You know, the kind that you would easily find at any kid's park, jungle gym, or indoor play area. Just over two meters high and almost three and a half meters long. And for the most part, it is a completely normal slide. If you were to just sit in it and glide down it feet first, nothing would happen. Then again, if SCP-1562 was an ordinary everyday piece of a playground, then the SCP Foundation would not have such a vested interest in it. They definitely wouldn't be keeping it locked up in quarantine, secured in testing lab 46-V of Site-24. And if any Foundation agents ask, you didn't hear that from us, by the way. The door to the lab is kept locked at all times. No member of personnel is even allowed near the slide unless granted special clearance to do so by Foundation researcher Dr. Carver. So what is it that makes this thing so special? Well, for one, SCP-1562 was first recovered by the Foundation from a defunct, abandoned playground. The location of this playground has been redacted, but it was known to be on the outskirts of a town where a number of young children had been reported missing. Does SCP-1562 contain some sort of clue as to where these children were taken? Perhaps some piece of forensic evidence left behind by a child-snatching anomaly from another dimension? Not quite. SCP-1562 is the thing that took those children. You see, the slide's anomalous properties require very specific circumstances in order to activate. Like we mentioned earlier, if you were just sitting on your butt while you were sliding down it, you would escape unscathed. Laying flat on your back? That is also a safe option. 
even flailing yourself about, spinning and rolling and waving your arms, changing position on the way down would mean that nothing anomalous would appear to happen. However, if someone enters SCP-1562 and travels down in head first, laying on their stomach with their arms tucked at their side, almost in a plank position, then that is when strange things start to happen. That is when a person finds out what happened to those missing children. Only about 15 centimeters from the opening of the slide, a person sliding down on their front, head first, with arms by their sides, will disappear right before exiting SCP-1562. In an instant, they will simply be gone, no longer in the slide or even relocated to anywhere nearby. To make matters worse, every single person that this has happened to has never been found again. They literally have vanished off the face of the Earth. Unfortunately, there isn't much that can be done to prevent this. During testing, the Foundation quickly learned that tethering a safety line to a subject does little to stop them from disappearing. They cannot be pulled back from wherever it is that the slide sends them. The rope they are attached to is simply cut and goes slack from the moment that a person is taken by the slide. Now that sounds like the whole story, right? Children are going missing and the Foundation learns it's because of SCP-1562 some kind of interdimensional portal within a playground slide. So they acquire the slide, take it away and keep it locked up securely where it can't cause any more disappearances. End of story. Except that's not quite the end. No, the one thing it's still possible to do once someone has disappeared down the slide is to stay in contact with them. The SCP Foundation has expended a number of test subjects by sending them sliding down SCP-1562 just to learn what's on the other side. Just where does the slide take them? Luckily, tests like this are precisely what the Foundation has D-Class personnel for. So what happened when the Foundation sent some D-Classes on a one-way joyride down the slide? Well, one test involved a D-Class designated D-2445 who disappeared into SCP-1562 but was given a two-way radio to communicate directly with Dr. Derritz, one of the research staff. D-2445 reported that he felt himself in a small cramped tunnel and quickly requested to be let back out. Dr. Derritz had neglected to tell D-2445 that was impossible and that no one ever came back from inside the slide. While it was too dark to see anything, the prisoner described still being laid on his front, but feeling like there were rocks or dirt surrounding him on all sides. Realizing that he barely had enough room to move or even lift his head, D-2445 again requested to be let out of SCP-1562. As the unfortunate D-Class grew increasingly more unsettled by the movement-restricting environment, Dr. Derritz revealed that the lifeline tethering D-2445 back to the Foundation had been severed upon their disappearance into the slide. Panicking, D-2445 managed to move forward slightly and realized that his head had hit something. A shoe. A tiny child's shoe. Communication with D-2445 was called to a halt, and the Foundation's researchers discussed possible ways that they could retrieve the prisoner. Although most of them probably knew at this point that this task was likely impossible, this test may have taken place before the Foundation realized that return from SCP-1562 was impossible. The plan was that another D-Class would be sent into the slide. Once again, they would be attached to a tether line and be carrying video and audio recording equipment, along with a GPS tracker and a headlamp. Reaching out to D-2445, Dr. Derritz relayed this plan to him. D-2445 immediately begged to be set free from SCP-1562, as the doctor attempted to calm him down, but to little effect. Something had scared him truly terrified him. A sound coming from somewhere within the tunnel. It, it started talking, D-2445 claimed. When Dr. Derritz asked for clarity, the D-Class replied saying that a little boy had tried to speak to him, but that the child had made little sense. He just kept asking where he was, and I told him I didn't know, but I don't think he was really talking to me, because he didn't respond to my voice, and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. When asked if this child had moved at all, D-2445 said that he was unsure. He started screaming and I told him to shut up, but he just kept screaming and crying and asking for his mommy. And then he finally stopped. And shortly after that, you contacted me again. Please get me out now. Dr. Derritz tried to reassure the man to little avail. 
and communication with D-2445 was cut off after he claimed something was wrong with his chest. Shortly after the Foundation lost communication with D-2445, another member of D-Class was sent into the slide after him. This subject, referred to officially as D-8600, had been specifically selected for this task thanks to his small stature. Dr. Derritz and the other Foundation researchers testing SCP-1562 believed that the man's thinner body type would allow D-8600 to better navigate the tunnel that the slides seemed to transport people to. And you can probably guess what happened next. Just like all the others that had been sent down the slide, D-8600 was trapped. His lifeline was cut the moment that he vanished inside the tunnel slide. On top of this, the GPS tracker that this thinner D-Class had been issued with seemed to not be working properly. Its signal could not be correctly traced, and without an accurate fix, there was no way to determine the location to which SCP-1562 was transporting its victims, if it was even in this universe. Additionally, the video feed from the camera D-8600 was carrying also failed to connect, with only audio from his radio being recovered by the research team. Contacting D-8600, Dr. Derritz was informed by this new D-Class that his headlamp had stopped working the second he had arrived in the same cave or tunnel as earlier test subjects. Before long, by shimmying through the area on his arms, D-8600 bumped into a foot, believed to be belonging to D-2445. While he could barely see anything, D-8600 could hear D-2445's voice, and this was being faintly picked up via his radio. However, as he and Dr. Derritz tried to talk to the first prisoner, his words began to sound all too familiar. I don't know, some sort of very small tunnel. It's really cramped. Can you get me out now? Followed by, no, it's, it's too dark, I can't see anything, and I'm stuck. It was all just a recording from what D-2445 had said when he first arrived after SCP-1562 had sent him into the tunnel. D-8600 did not realize this at first and attempted to help his fellow prisoner, hoping to pull him out of wherever they were trapped. Dr. Derritz tried desperately to explain that D-2445 was just repeating his half of an earlier conversation, but D-8600 hardly noticed that was the case. He gripped the other D-Class's ankles and told the doctor to pull them out of the tunnel. The doctor revealed that once again the tether line had been severed, but D-8600 refused to believe that escape was impossible. He tried to worm his way back the way he had come, leaving D-2445 still repeating his words from earlier. He just kept asking me where he was and I told him I didn't know, but I don't think he was really talking to me because he didn't respond to my voice and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. I don't think so. He started screaming and I told him to shut up, but he kept just screaming and crying and asking for his mommy. Then he finally stopped and shortly after that you contacted me again. Please get me out now. Please hurry, my chest is really starting to hurt. After yelling at him to stop talking multiple times, D-8600 noted that D-2445 had finally gone quiet. The D-Class also remarked that the air was starting to taste stale and hoped that there would be enough oxygen for him to get back. Then, just like his predecessor, communication with D-8600 came to an abrupt stop. Dr. Derritz was no longer able to reach him on the radio. There was nothing but static. The Foundation was unable to re-establish contact with either of the two D-Class personnel lost inside SCP-1562, and any future testing of the tunnel slide was suspended. To this day, none of us know what exactly happened to the victims of the tunnel slide. Where were they taken? What? had taken them. What was making the prior victims repeat their ominous words? As horror author Stephen King once put it, it's the unanswered questions that stays with us the longest. But the next time you decide to thrill your inner child by taking a jaunt to your local kitty park, you may just find out for yourself. 2 a.m., a few miles outside the city. The car tore down the asphalt at 60 miles an hour. We kept the beams low. The dark road around us only illuminated by the occasional street lamp overhead. Things moved unseen in the trees. An old song rattled off the radio. The connection was patchy, so it was interrupted by intermittent spikes of static. It was the kind of night when you knew, deep down, that anything could happen. You just hoped that anything would be in your favor. I rolled the window down a few minutes ago, breathing in all that cold, fresh air to stave off the looming specter of sleep. Thank God I wasn't the one driving or things would have gotten deadly way sooner. 
cops would have found us with our bumper wrapped around a tree, our heads one with the steering wheel or the windshield dead on impact, or from the unforgiving cold overnight. They might have even felt sorry for us until they found the case. Perhaps it would have been better that way. At least it would have been quick. A lot of bad things can happen on lonely state highways in the dead of night, and we were about to find out that just crashing your car was one of the more mild ones. Scott was driving. He was also the one who brokered this whole deal. I was just coming along to provide backup. There was a fully loaded Saturday night special sitting in my inner coat pocket, hoping that it wouldn't see any action tonight, and a pump action shotgun sitting in the back in case things got really hairy. Deals like this, you either come well prepared, or reckon with a heavy chance you sure as hell won't be leaving. I never asked Scott how he came into the goods currently sitting in the briefcase, and he never offered an explanation either. He only told me that he'd already secured a very interested potential buyer from a syndicate out of town. Serious people. Dangerous people. They'd pay top dollar, or leave us tied up in trash bags in a ditch off the side of the highway. But we both needed money, and we were willing to take that risk if it meant we could return from this deal as a pair of rich men. The terms of the deal were simple. We drive out onto a certain state highway at a little after 2 a.m. with the goods. Meet the buyers at a certain rest stop along the way and make the exchange. We then all go our separate ways, and if we were lucky, none of us would ever see each other ever again. Seemed simple enough, sure. Scott seemed downright chipper about the whole thing. And for a little while, I was excited too, until he told me about the road that the buyers wanted to meet us on. We'd all heard legends about the place. Superstitions, really. People think criminals are scary, but believe me, we're a surprisingly superstitious bunch. Our profession is one largely based on luck, being in the right place at the right time, and being lucky enough to avoid the cops along the way. But something you need to know, whether you're a criminal or arrow straight, is that some places are always going to be the wrong place. I'm not going to tell you which road it is. I know what you knuckleheads are like. You're curious. You're thrill seekers. Hey, we were all young once, but if I tell you what this road is, I know you're going to try to find it. Maybe you'll even decide it's worth the trip down for a pleasant Sunday drive. <laughs> After what I went through on that road, I wouldn't wish a trip down it on my worst enemy. There's no other word for what we encountered there other than evil. When we were kids, we used to call it the Devil's Passage. Every spooky rumor and scary story in the book circulated about that place. Let me see what I can remember. Well, there was the Watcher in the Woods. People used to say that there was a long, tall figure with the biggest eyes you had ever seen. Eyes like headlights, standing amongst the trees. If the moonlight shone in the right angle as you were driving past, you'd see it standing there, just staring at you, thinking about doing who knows what. Then there was Old Beth, the ghostly hitchhiker. People used to say they saw a strange old woman hobbling down the side of the road in the middle of the night. Sometimes people said that they could hear her crying, even if they were far enough away to make such a thing seem impossible. If you took pity on her and pulled over, asking her if she needed a ride, she'd tell you that you were a very kind person, but that she was fine and dandy walking along by herself. But if you didn't stop and offer her a lift, if you just drove away, well, local legend had it that the next time you'd see her face would be in your rearview mirror as she sat in your back seat, reaching for you with her ancient bony claws. It'd make you think twice about leaving an old woman to walk home alone in the dark. And, of course, there was the lone jogger. The stories my dad told me about him always used to scare the hell out of me. He was a pale man, dressed unnaturally light for the cold winter months, jogging along the side of the road. If you looked at him, he'd look back. If your eyes ever met, the stories went that he'd start running after you. It wouldn't matter how fast you drove, he'd somehow always catch up and stare at you through the glass of your car's windows. He never hurt anyone directly, but I imagine he probably caused a heart attack or two in his time, if he ever really existed. But all of these things were nothing, I repeat, nothing, compared to the Phantom Cruiser. You have to drive cautiously at night, because if you didn't, you might find a ghostly 1970s police cruiser tailgating you, and that'd be the worst thing you ever saw. There were fewer stories about this one than all the others, because if you ever ran afoul of the Phantom Cruiser, chances are that you wouldn't survive to tell people about what happened to you, though people could still make an educated guess about what happened to you based on whatever was left behind. Here's a not-so-fun fact. The Devil's Passage is technically qualified for one of the most dangerous highways in the country, from crashes to hitchhiker murders to unexplained deaths on the side of the road. Since 1974, 
this road has been an incredibly unpleasant place to drive. Every time I saw another horror story about a strange death on the road, I'd think of the Phantom Cruiser, and it was those same thoughts polluting my brain that night as Scott drove the two of us to the rest stop halfway down the Devil's Passage. I only realized I'd dozed off when he nudged me awake, and the blurry lights of distant street lamps flashed into my field of vision. Look alive, he said. We're here. The rest stop wasn't much to look at. All that there was was an abandoned gas station, really the perfect place for this kind of illicit deal. My hand moved instinctively to the special in my coat and clicked back the hammer. Something about this whole setup wasn't right. Sting operation? Police ambush? This whole thing reeked of a deal too good to be true. My instincts turned out to be right, in a sense, just not the way I was expecting. As we turned into the rest stop, Scott turned up his beams. All we saw was carnage waiting for us. A car, presumably one that once belonged to our prospective buyers, in a state of horrific disarray. It looked as though a train had impacted the side of the vehicle, completely caving it in. The metal was covered in deep scratches and ruts that almost looked like claw marks. It had been eviscerated. Scott broke hard, and we both got out of the car. I drew the special out of my jacket, and he grabbed the shotgun out of the back seat. We approached with caution, worrying this might just be another part of the setup, until we saw the thick puddle of blood congealing under the driver's side door. We drew closer, propelled by morbid curiosity. Was it a hit from a rival gang looking to intercept the deal? It seemed logical, but there were no bullet holes in the car just ripping, tearing, and massive impact damage. Scott shined the light of his phone into the destroyed car, and I vomited when I saw what was inside. The buyers looked less like people, and more like two sacks of pulled pork in tattered clothes. If I hadn't seen them inside the car, I wouldn't have even guessed they were human, and the damage wasn't just to them. The upholstery was torn up and burned, with violent symbols carved into the walls and scrawled onto the cracked windows in blood. When I turned to Scott, he was ghost white, clutching his phone and shotgun with trembling hands. We didn't exchange a word, but we both knew it was time to leave. We could find another buyer. There'd be other opportunities, other deals. But lives? You only get one. And we both silently acknowledged that if we stuck around here much longer, we wouldn't even have that. We sped back into the car and locked the doors behind us, for whatever good that would do, considering the damage that had been done to the buyers and their car. Perhaps we just needed the illusion of security to get us the hell out of there. The car pulled out of the rest stop at breakneck speed. Scott floored it, trying to put some good distance between us and the horror at that rest stop. Whatever had happened to the buyers, we didn't fancy sharing that same awful fate. My heart dropped down to my guts when I heard the sirens and flashing lights behind us. After all of this, we'd been busted for speeding. They'd pull us over and find the guns and the briefcase in the car, and they'd have a lot of questions that neither of us would have good answers to. We didn't know whether to slow down and hope for the best, or speed up and take this boy in blue on a genuine car chase. This whole thing couldn't have gone more wrong. But my thoughts soon drifted from getting used to the taste of prison food to something altogether more sinister. When I saw the car getting closer in the rearview mirror, I realized that this wasn't a modern cop car tailing us. It was a beat-up old 70s cruiser, traveling at insane speeds, gaining on us. The high beams cut through me like razor blades. I heard the radio crackle into life, even though neither I nor Scott touched it. It wasn't music, just a hoarse, scratchy voice repeating the word, RUN, again and again. And seeing as whatever was behind us clearly wasn't a real cop, we were more than happy to oblige that request. Scott hit the gas like our lives depended on it, which, to be fair, they did. But no matter how fast we sped up, the cruiser kept getting closer, like a demon on our tail. I screamed at Scott to go faster, but we were going as fast as we could. Next thing I knew, the Phantom Cruiser collided with the backside of our car and sent us into a spin, showering the two of us with broken glass crystals as the tires screeched across the asphalt. It felt like an eternity before the car came to a rest, and at that moment, the Phantom Cruiser stopped too. Someone got out. He was dressed like a cop, he even looked like a cop. A dude in his 40s, balding, overweight, with a handlebar mustache. But something was wrong about him. He didn't say a word as he approached the car, and he didn't seem to register me sliding the special out of my jacket either. He was inches away from Scott's window when I panicked and opened fire, sending a hail of small caliber rounds into his gut. He stumbled back slightly, as though shocked, and then everything got a whole lot worse. The cop let out the most awful bellow, not of pain, but of pure rage. Something happened to his face. His eyes started to glow a bright, hellish red, 
and his jaw began to extend until he looked like a munch painting. There were no teeth in there, just an infinite black void. He grabbed a dazed Scott through the window, pulling him into a brutal headlock and dragging him out of the car, releasing those deranged bellows the entire time. Scott screamed and pleaded for help. I grabbed his body and tried to pull him back, but the cop was inhumanly strong. He just kept pulling until he was all the way out, thrashing on the asphalt. I, I, I don't want to tell you what he did next. Wouldn't be right. But suffice to say, I couldn't save Scott. And I definitely didn't want it happening to me. While he was working on Scott, I scrambled into the driver's seat and floored it, hoping that Scott would at least buy me some time. I was weeping in terror as I drove away into the dark, leaving my friend to a horrible fate with the driver of the Phantom Cruiser. So you can only imagine how I felt when a few minutes later, I heard the sirens again and saw the bright lights getting closer behind me. Run, run, run. Throwing indestructible lizards into vats of acid, hunting strange chicken men through forests in Ireland, arguing in Latin with a man wearing a haunted Roman centurion's helmet. When you join the SCP Foundation, you might be expecting high-octane drama all of the time. Especially with the name Street Sweepers, you'd expect this mobile task force to be neck deep in some real action-packed street racing. Maybe you wouldn't think that they'd be tasked with driving all day every day in four-hour shifts tailing a semi-truck all over Birmingham, Alabama. But as Agent Moore and his colleague pulled into the lay-by behind the truck, neither of them were ready for what they were about to witness. SCP-2590 was first discovered by the Foundation at a routine traffic stop. Investigating a totally different anomaly in the Birmingham area, Agents Peters and Smith had been posing as local police officers. The Foundation had been trying to track down an artifact that was supposedly being smuggled across the U.S. in the back of a nondescript station wagon. Peters and Smith had been allocated a pair of beat-up old police cruisers, which they'd parked across the dirt road, fully blocking any traffic from coming through. It was several hours into their shift when the incident occurred, just at the point they were starting to lose focus. Taking a look through the suitcases and memorabilia from a family's trip to Disney World, Peters had taken way too long to hear the noise of the engine swelling behind him. He spun around to see the hulking shape of the semi-truck barreling straight towards him, Agent Smith, and a family of five. With only two seconds to react, he yelled out at the top of his lungs and dived out of the way, leaving the trunk of the car wide open with five screams emerging from inside. Smith, who had been sitting in one of the cruisers, only just managed to get out before the semi made contact. Eyes closed, Agent Peters waited for the inevitable sound of screaming rubber, the bang of metal on metal, and the shower of glass on asphalt, but it never came. When he opened his eyes, the station wagon was still parked up in front of them, the two police cruisers still blocking the road and all of the Disney merch still piled high in the trunk. The semi was driving off along the road on the other side of their blockade with not a scratch on it. Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Smith, who had kept his eyes open and witnessed the whole thing, leapt into action. He ordered his partner, still lying confused in the dirt, to administer Class A amnestics to the family and call in for backup. Agent Smith himself jammed his keys into the ignition twisting them so hard he almost bent the metal, and took off after the vehicle. What Agent Smith and Peters had just witnessed was the very first Foundation exposure to SCP-2590, fondly nicknamed Trailer Trash. As Smith pulled up alongside the vehicle and studied it for the first time, he made a note of its initial appearance over the radio, an appearance which remains unchanged years later. The badges on the vehicle claim that it is an international ProStar day cab semi-trailer truck, complete with an unmarked trailer. As the agent flicked on his lights and indicated that the vehicle should pull over, he noted that it didn't have any license plates on it, either front or rear. He leaned forward in his seat, trying to peer into the cab to make out the driver, but in the Alabama sun, the man just looked like a shadowy figure. They drove side by side along the road for almost a mile, the truck made no signs of pulling over despite Agent Smith's continued insistence and repeated flashes of the cop lights, but it also didn't attempt to pull away either. It just continued to drive a few miles per hour below the speed limit. The driver didn't seem to look across at him once. 
Having discussed it with Foundation staff, they decided it was best not to draw attention to the situation. They had no idea whether this SCP was hostile or posed any threat to civilian life, but having blue and red lights flashing at it appeared to be doing little to change the situation. Instead, he switched off the sirens and pulled in behind the truck, tailing it around Birmingham as the Foundation readied further agents to respond to the situation. For almost an hour, nothing of note happened. Agent Smith drove behind the trailer, watching it like a hawk. He observed that it obeyed every traffic law to a T. It never broke the speed limit, never cut anyone off, and left room for other vehicles to merge. If it hadn't seen it drive straight through a roadblock as if it wasn't there, he would have never suspected a thing. But then the truck turned its turn signal on. They had just come off the highway and merged onto a quiet side street, just as the sun was starting to hang low in the sky. The truck crept across the side of the road, squeezing its brakes gently, and stopped. Agent Smith matched the action the whole way, pulling up about 20 feet behind the trailer. In constant radio communication, he kicked open his door and stepped out into the evening air. Foundation personnel advised that he keep his hand on his gun at all times and approach with caution. He didn't really need them to tell him that. Smith called for the driver to step out of the cab. No response. The truck just sat there with its hazards on, engine off. After a moment, there was a clunk, and the trailer door started to slowly open, all by itself. Agent Smith called in backup, but they were still several minutes out. Instead, he ran back to the car, gun raised, and waited to see what was inside as the door slowly opened to reveal nothing. No, not quite nothing. There was something small on the floor of the trailer, right in the center as if it hadn't been moved around at all by the vehicle's motion. It was red, a kind of elongated cuboid. He reported it all to the Foundation over his radio, then paused when he recognized what it was. A Kit Kat candy bar, or to be more specific, a Kit Kat Chunky. What happened after this point was hazy. Agent Smith was found on the roadside just 20 minutes later, confused about what had happened. The truck was nowhere in sight. However, a security camera from a convenience store just up the street happened to capture the interaction. In the footage, you see Agent Smith approaching the trailer with his gun raised, looking at the Kit Kat. He tries to enter the trailer, but is unable to, so he approaches the driver's side door. While talking to the shadowy figure in the cab, he drops his gun and stands motionless, a confused and sleepy expression on his face, until the trailer door closes and the SCP drives away. Contact was re-established with SCP-2590 soon after, and has been maintained almost uninterrupted ever since. The findings made on that initial encounter seem to hold true across further examination. Personnel have reached out to Navistar International, the company that supposedly manufactures this model of semi-truck, but there appears to be no records of its creation or shipment to the US. In fact, no documentation at all can be attributed to the truck or any components on it. The driver in the front cab is a humanoid figure who is perpetually shrouded in shadow, designated SCP-2590-1. Attempts to reveal the driver's figures have proved ineffective, as even powerful spotlights do not shed enough light into the cab to render the driver visible. Quite what this driver's role is in the operation of SCP-2590 is unknown. SCP-2590-1 appears to have some proximity-based amnestic qualities, as anyone approaching it on foot has reported memory loss and confusion soon after, just like Agent Smith. As also discovered by the two agents and their roadblock, containment of this SCP is simply not possible. While the majority of the time the SCP is corporeal, it possesses the ability to pass through solid objects at will. All attempted roadblocks have resulted in the same thing happening. The SCP will just phase right through on them as if nothing was there. Since it cannot be contained in the usual way, a different operation has been set up to monitor the truck's activities, which so far have proven to be apparently harmless to the civilian population. Mobile Task Force Gamma-133, also known as the Street Sweepers, has been established to follow this SCP around Birmingham at all times. They operate in four-hour shifts, with two agents in unmarked vehicles sticking close behind the trailer at all times. The Foundation was able to fit a tracking device onto it as well, providing researchers with continuous location data for where they can find the vehicle. At seemingly random times, supposedly determined by the SCP itself, it pulls over somewhere quiet, 
and opens the door to its trailer. The door will remain open for 60 seconds and then close again. Any attempts to enter the trailer have been blocked by some kind of invisible barrier, seemingly impenetrable to most approaches. More violent and destructive methods of entry cannot be authorized for testing due to the heavy civilian population in the surrounding area. Every time the doors open, there is something different in the trailer. Researchers are trying to ascertain some kind of pattern or messaging behind most of the objects, but many seem to be random. The current list of things that have appeared in the back of SCP-2590 include an iPhone 3G, a red apple, and a lit light bulb without any visible form of power supply. Most notable about the objects in the trailer is that often they appear to be human beings, as happened on the night that Agent Moore was on duty in the Street Sweepers. The agents pulled in behind the truck as per usual when it slowed to a stop beside the highway. Agent Moore got out of the vehicle second, unenthused about the monotony of the task he had been assigned. Expecting to see a cardboard box or a chapstick when the trailer door opened, he was left shocked when he came face to face with himself. Few people can say they have seen themselves in real life. Most of them have been administered with various anesthetics to make them forget, but Agent Moore went on to report how bizarre of an experience it was. He claimed that it was utterly unlike looking in a mirror where your reflection is flipped and follows your every move. Seeing yourself standing in three dimensions, moving independently and evidently in a great deal of distress is an experience that few would envy. Any time a human being materializes in the trailer, they appear to be in a great deal of distress as they attempt to escape through the invisible barrier. Agent Moore and his partner Agent Hall could do nothing but stand and watch in confusion as the copy of him attempted to free himself before. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the vehicle pulled away again. Several instances have occurred of duplicate humans appearing in the trailer, but each time the original person seems to have had no knowledge of this taking place and nothing out of the ordinary happens to them. However, there appears to be some small pattern demonstrating the SCP as an awareness of the Foundation, as it has also duplicated Agent Inglis's sister who has no connection to this SCP at all. Incident 16 was the most distressing of all, as a large slab of metal appeared in the back of the trailer with the SCP Foundation logo painted across it. Agent Inglis and Schultz were on duty at this time and observed copious amounts of blood flowing out of the metal slab. Before long, the blood filled the back of the trailer, pushing up against the invisible barrier. All of a sudden, 52 seconds into the encounter, the barrier vanished, and a cascade of blood with the slab inside were launched out at the two agents at a speed of over 190 kilometers an hour, killing them both instantly. Since this incident, SCP-2590 has been treated with greater caution. The most mysterious thing to have come from researching this truck came on December 4, 2011, when, for the first time, the truck's tracking beacon stopped working. It had been seen pulling into an abandoned warehouse, and so a team of street sweepers was immediately dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found the vehicle moving through the warehouse at a slow crawl. Choosing to pursue on foot and leave a pair of agents at the entrance, they followed the SCP through the facility until it came to what agents described as a service tunnel or sewer of some sort. Putting headlamps on, they followed the truck down into the tunnel, maintaining radio contact throughout. As they reported the direction they were traveling and the distance, it quickly became apparent to Foundation personnel that this was no ordinary tunnel. The warehouse was positioned overlooking a cliff, and so the geography was not physically possible. As the street sweepers descended further into the tunnel, they noted there was increased levels of carbon monoxide. Radio contacts started to dip in and out, losing signal as they went further downhill. Just at the edge of their signal with the Foundation, the truck stopped and opened its trailer door. Inside was just a single piece of parchment with the words, I'm just delivering a message written on it. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the truck continued. After they had passed the kilometer mark, the radio signal worsened quickly and after a couple of scrambled messages, the team down there were not heard from again. The channel stayed open for another six hours before the Foundation made the decision to announce the agents missing in action. In March 2015, over three years later, a radio signal came into contact with the Foundation again from Birmingham, Alabama. It was from the headset of the squad leader who had gone into the tunnel. 
Initially confused as to who had gained access to the comms channel, the Foundation demanded that the agent state his full name and rank. The agent, himself confused, obliged, questioning why they were so suspicious. He and his team claimed to have only lost contact for about 15 minutes. They had followed the FCP a little further until carbon monoxide levels had risen too high to continue, at which point they had watched the truck disappearing into the distance as they walked back to the surface. All agents have undergone extensive psychological rehabilitation to settle them back into society, as well as classes to fill them in on things like the London Olympics, the Ice Bucket Challenge, and Gangnam Style. As for SCP-2590, it is back out on the roads, roaming around Birmingham, Alabama continuously, never stopping for fuel, always obeying the rules of the road, occasionally opening its trailer doors to reveal new and bizarre findings. Joe sighed to himself quietly, looking out of the window at the still, silent stretch of highway snaking through the desert, only to disappear somewhere over the horizon. The sun was slowly crawling down, almost completely vanished from sight, and he knew when it was gone, there'd be no light left in the desert. It wasn't the same kind of darkness you found in a city. There they had street lights and cars whizzing through with their headlights on full blast. It never really got dark in the cities, but out here, nothing but true pitch black darkness for miles around, only alleviated when the sky was clear enough for the stars to shine through or broken by the beams of a passing car speeding down the highway. Giving another sigh, Joe sipped on his coffee. By this point, it was lukewarm to match the dropping temperature outside and bitter to the taste. But he needed the caffeine to keep himself awake. After all, he had a long night ahead of him, but then again, they were all long nights in this line of work. This was the only diner for miles around and he had no idea just how many hours it would be before he next got to eat or drink anything. With an almost empty pot with the last dregs of coffee in one hand, the waitress came up to Joe at his table. It was the last spot in the diner with anyone still sitting in it. Closing time, she told him with a tired smile. One for the road? Nodding, Joe lifted his travel mug for her to fill. As her workday was ending, his was about to start. He grabbed his jacket and slung it over his shoulder leaving a few dollars as a tip on the table before he made his way out of the diner and over to his car. Buckling into the driver's seat, Joe took a deep breath as he pulled his phone out of his pocket, dreading the potential barrage of notifications that would come flooding through the second he did. Opening up the corresponding app, he clocked in for the night, and sure enough, was instantly met with a veritable tidal wave of requests. Grumbling quietly to himself, he tapped accept on the first one he saw, and turned the key in the ignition. Working as a driver for a carpool and ride-sharing service was far from a simple job at the best of times, but even more so in this particular area of the southwestern United States. The state of New Mexico shared a border not only with Texas, but with Chihuahua, one of the northernmost states of Mexico. Being so close to the border meant that most of the calls and requests for lifts that Joe received on an average night meant he needed to bounce back and forth between the US and Mexico, crossing the border at his client's request. Legally, of course. We're not going all Breaking Bad here today. Some nights weren't so complicated. Someone might just need a quick ride from Dona Ana to the town of truth or consequences, a New Mexico town named after, we kid you not, a TV game show. Sure, that might have been a 75-mile drive up the I-25, but at least it didn't involve crossing from El Paso into the city of Juarez. At this time of night, it was nowhere near as busy as during the day, but even so, that didn't make hopping back and forth over the border and all the red tape it entailed any less of an arduous process, especially stuck behind the wheel of a car for hours on end. Tonight, however, wasn't a simple night. Joe's first call was for a pickup from a couple whose flight had been rerouted to the international airport in Juarez. They seemed to be newlyweds and demanded to be taken all the way back to a hotel in Las Cruces, making it abundantly clear that they didn't want to stay closer to the airport and outright refusing when Joe offered to recommend them some nearby hotels. Getting to know most of the area around the three-way intersection between New Mexico, Texas, and the Mexican border after driving around it so many times, he'd gotten to know the area pretty well. Unfortunately, not everyone wanted to hear a display of Joe's local knowledge. Most of them just wanted him to drive them in silence. 
Next up, a group of rowdy guys, real frat house types from the University of El Paso, Texas. They wanted to be taken to a bar halfway across the city. A bit more of a straightforward trip, Joe thought. Although he could have done without them drunkenly chanting spring break at the top of their lungs every five minutes. After that, it was another jaunt across the border, this time transporting a suit and Stenson-wearing Texas gentleman to Horizon City. He spent the whole ride on his phone, talking at length about a business deal he'd just closed, not saying a word to Joe the entire time. Doug Dimadome, eat your heart out. The next person to request a lift wasn't much more talkative either. She was a 20-something girl who plainly stated she just wanted to get far away from Sierra Blanca. Hours and hours had ticked by since Joe had left the diner. The last of the coffee in his travel mug had been finished long before. His next ride request had come through and required him to once again make the drive out to the other side of the border. By this point, the evening had turned into night and was now approaching the earliest hours of the following morning, the desert still filled with nothing but deep, inky blackness. The same desert that had scorched acres upon acres of skin that had taken so many lives, big and small, and had picked the skin and flesh from countless bones. The desert can be a truly merciless place at the best of times, but sometimes there's a little something more out there just waiting for you, dark and hungry. Occasionally, as he drove back towards El Paso, Joe would see another car speeding towards him on the other side of the highway, but it was so dark that he could see nothing of the driver. Only their headlights were visible, right up until they drove past him, everything behind the hood of the oncoming car almost imperceptible as it whizzed through the night. Crossing the border so many times a night, Joe had become friendly with a few of the officers that patrolled the gates, waving cars past after they'd shown the necessary paperwork. He was never usually held there for long enough to start actual conversations with them, exchanging only a friendly nod or one-liner with the few border patrol guards whose names he could still remember. But sometimes, when things were a little quieter at the gates, he'd overhear the odd passing comment while his driver's side window was rolled down. Tonight, as the long barrier in front of his car was raised, Joe caught a few words coming through on a radio belonging to one of the guards, something vague about sightings of phantom lights. He chuckled to himself, writing it off as yet another alleged alien sighting. Something about the desert at night really seemed to capture people's imaginations, Joe thought to himself, as he pulled away from the border gate heading for the I-10. There were always stories like that circulating around this area of New Mexico. It was easy to see why, being so close to Roswell, New Mexico, the home of alien sightings, and just a couple hundred miles away from the true alien mecca, Area 51, a United States Air Force base that secretly housed alien life forms and spaceships, allegedly at least, if years of conspiracy believers and Facebook memers are to be believed. Every so often, one of Joe's passengers would ask him about unidentified flying objects, or he'd overhear them talking amongst themselves about a slew of urban legends, phantom hitchhikers that would hitch rides on the highway, only to vanish from the back seats of cars, and of course, tales of disembodied floating lights, either hovering way up in the sky or just above the ground. Regardless of whichever one was popular at any given moment, Joe knew there were plenty of weird and spooky stories coming out of the desert. What he was unaware of, however, was that he was currently in one of his own. He'd been so wrapped up in thoughts of what he might do if one of the people that hired him turned out to be a wandering spirit that Joe didn't even notice he had made a wrong turn. It was only by the virtue of glancing at his car's GPS that he even realized, and by then, it had been long enough since that he was completely unsure how far back it was that he had made such an error. According to the map, he was nowhere. He hadn't stopped. His car was still moving at a steady speed down the long stretch of asphalt, but the GPS didn't show any road at his current location. He had no clue which part of which highway he was even on. Short on options and short on time to get to his next client for the night, Joe just did what his job required of him. He kept on driving. Anyone watching from a distance would have seen an empty, lengthy portion of highway with but one single car traveling along it, only the headlights both illuminating the road in front of it and giving away the car's position. Slowing down slightly just to play it safe, Joe tried searching up where he was using the Maps app on his phone. He figured he wouldn't get stopped for checking his phone while driving, or be much risk to any other drivers on the road. After all, it seemed like his was the only car around for miles. Even if he was still heading in near enough the right direction for his next pickup, that would be at least some saving grace. 
Maybe the map on the car's built-in GPS was a little outdated, he thought, and that was preventing this part of the highway from showing up. Connection to the internet was extremely limited this far out in the New Mexico desert, and by the time the map loaded, it didn't provide much in the way of new information or even the slightest bit of comforting reassurance. It only seemed to agree with the GPS that Joe was well and truly lost. As he took his free hand off the wheel for a split second, just to try and zoom in on the satellite view of the terrain, two bright white lights appeared in the distance. Startled, Joe dropped his phone into the front passenger seat, hearing it slip onto the floor of the car as he gripped the steering wheel again, both hands back to ten and two. The lights were speeding in the opposite direction he was driving in, a fair few feet ahead of him, but still, it was another vehicle on this otherwise empty, isolated stretch of the highway. A loud and sudden idea rang out in Joe's head. If he could signal what he had assumed to be another approaching car, he could ask the driver where exactly he was, and what the quickest route to get back to the I-10 was. He couldn't guarantee he would make the oncoming vehicle stop and help him after all. So few people would willingly trust a stranger on the highway, but considering his only other options were to either keep driving along this seemingly endless road, or to turn back around and try to find wherever it was he'd made the wrong turn in the first place, needless to say, Joe's hands were a little tied. Tapping the appropriate switch affixed to his wheel, he flicked on his own headlights on and off in an effort to catch the other driver's attention. Nothing. The pair of headlights kept their current course both theirs and Joe's traveling parallel to each other, as if they were about to joust with their beams of light. Hitting the switch again, Joe tried lowering his headlight setting and then raising them back to full brightness, still nothing from the other driver. He pushed the emergency button that activated both the front and rear lights of the car, but this one only yielded the same result. Deciding there was nothing else that he could do, Joe gently pulled his vehicle over, parking abruptly at this side of the highway. He instinctively checked his rear view, only to remember that there wasn't anyone behind him, just him and the apparently oblivious driver approaching ahead. In a last-ditch effort to get their attention, Joe punched the car horn, rolling down his window in order to listen for a response. The blaring noise echoed through the empty desert night, a loud and sustained blast followed by a beat of silence as Joe paused, waiting to hear the same sound back from the oncoming vehicle. He squinted at it through the dark. It was still pretty far, but closing rapidly or as far as he could tell it was. All he had to go on was the advancing lights, with nothing visible behind them. Joe leaned out of his window, hoping that it would somehow give him better visibility through the sheer darkness of a desert at night. It did as little to improve things as a second, much longer blast of his horn did. The other driver still didn't react. By now, the lights were close enough that whoever was behind the other wheel would be able to see Joe. And yet, they didn't do anything to change their speed didn't flicker their lights back or sound their own horn. Nothing. Just the same two points of light. They might as well have been floating just above the ground, given how they obscured what was behind them. At this point, Joe was certain they were close enough to see him now. Little more than a few feet in front of his stationary car and still closing at a sustained speed. Getting agitated, he went to hit his horn a third time when he noticed something. Or rather, he noticed something that he hadn't. This car hurtling towards him through the night wasn't making any sound. It wasn't just that the other driver deliberately hadn't returned the signals Joe had been trying to give, there was no noise coming from it whatsoever. No grumbling of an engine, nor the rolling of rubber tires against the asphalt surface of the highway. It was silent, just the pair of ominous lights soundlessly racing through the night, heading straight for where Joe was sat, parked still, a sitting duck like he was defenseless prey. Violently turning the key in the ignition, Joe slammed his foot down on the accelerator. His car sputtered to life and careened down the road. He was headed straight for the other car, if it even was a car, hoping to shoot straight past it and take his chances continuing along the highway alone. The lights were almost on top of him now, still too bright to make out anything behind them, but there was still no engine noise, nothing to indicate what the hell it even was, until one of them jumped onto the hood of his car. An orb of light attached to a thrashing shape beneath, parted from the other. It leaped through the air and came down right in the path of Joe's car, just as he was about to pass what he first thought to be another car. The light smashed directly through the windshield, Joe instinctively lifting an arm to cover his face and protect his eyes from the impending shower of broken glass. But it was in that second that he took his eyes off the road that the other light made its move. It had been perfectly parallel with Joe's car, only to turn sharply and violently. 
connecting with the driver's side door with enough force to not only dent the metal surface, but to completely lift the car up. It barreled sideways, tumbling over itself off the highway and into the surrounding desert. Trapped inside, buckled tight, Joe was thrown about in his seat, unable to study himself as the car rolled. His arm was still over his face, splinters of glass showering over him. The whatever it was, was still thrashing about, its glow illuminating the entire interior of the car, until the whole vehicle came to a stop, landing upside down, wheels in the air pointing up at the cloudy night sky. Hanging the wrong way up, Joe reached for his seatbelt and unclasped it. His head instantly dropped onto the ceiling of the upturned car. Through the shattered driver's side window, he crawled out on his hands. The pain was shooting through his whole body, bruises and blood covering his arms, an intense, agonizing feeling of broken bones on top of that. Rolling over onto his back, Joe looked up at the wreck of his car, his livelihood, and the monster standing in front of it. Illuminated fully for the first time by the car's still active headlights, the thing had managed to pull itself free from the destroyed windshield and was now pacing slowly around the overturned hood. It walked on two legs, but it didn't move like a man. In fact, it didn't even look like one. It was like something pulled straight out of prehistoric times. A pair of hinged limbs supporting a streamlined reptilian body with hooked claws on its feet. Its back was arched, keeping itself low as its two arms stayed close to its center. The creature had almost human-like hands, but each finger was tipped with long, pointed talons. But its head was what Joe saw first, what he had seen at a distance and mistaken for car headlights only a few minutes ago. In the place he wouldn't have expected to see a pair of slitted eyes staring at him was a bulbous mass of a head. Bioluminescent light glowed from beneath the monster's skin, a brain visible amongst a web of bright organs, and beneath that, a wide, gaping maw of sharp teeth. Joe noticed another light drawing near, brightening the area where he lay defenseless. The second of the raptor-like monsters was pacing closer to him, both their glowing heads kept low to the ground ready to strike. Yep, yeah, looks pretty clear to me, one of the men disguised as a highway patrol officer announced. Handprints match up with what their front paws look like, no trace of the driver, just a big wreck in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, better get on the horn to control then, his colleague replied, wearing a similar uniform. I thought SCP-745s were only found a little north of here. Well, we shut off the section of the highway they usually show up at, the first Foundation agent explained casually, sipping his coffee as he looked at the upturned wreckage of Joe's car. His body was nowhere to be found, but every now and then a couple of them will show up a bit away from there. One of them wouldn't come this far into the south of New Mexico on its own, though. Ah, because of the lights, right? His fellow agent responded, the two of them walking back towards the car. Yeah, their heads, they mimic car headlights or something. Well, there's that. The first man nodded, taking one last look at the long, open desert around them and the highway stretching through it. Plus, it must get lonely traveling out here on your own. True horror. The airplane door. Belching smoke and a burning red light. The dead talking in ancient guttural Latin. A monstrous angel made of rings, wings, and eyes whipping barbed tentacles at screaming, terrified priests. You can scarcely imagine a more hellish place. Bishop Franklin's knees gave out under him as soon as the man set foot back on solid ground. Nearing his 70th birthday, he'd never been a particularly tough man, but after the day he'd had, he doubted he'd ever be the same again. Almost being ripped into another dimension, almost being at the center of a nuclear explosion, seeing. He threw up on the ground as the Foundation personnel rushed over to him. Never, never again. Just eight hours earlier, Bishop Franklin had been getting on with his Friday preparations. They had mass coming up this weekend, so he was doing the rounds of the cathedral, putting out new candles and straightening pews. He was nearly done, ready to get on with the rest of his morning, when he saw two suited figures entering the cathedral. He shuffled over to them, trying to explain that they were closed, but quickly faltered when he saw the grave look on their faces. Just ten minutes later, he was in the back of their car, still holding a spare candle, with agents from the SCP Foundation sitting on either side of him. They handed him file after file each most redacted, explaining the basis of who they were and where they were headed. It was a lot for the old priest to wrap his head around. He'd always believed in a higher power and a spiritual realm, but this sounded a whole lot more serious than that. 
Monsters, aliens, other dimensions, facilities, portals. He questioned the agents on it. They just looked grimly from one to another as the car wound its way to the private airstrip in the middle of nowhere. Bishop Franklin had always hated flying, but he hated it a whole lot more as he approached the airplane with no idea where he'd be landing. A small group of men were gathered on the runway, just by the foot of a Boeing aircraft. It seemed like a pretty substantial plane for such a small group of them. He was at least a little heartened to see that none of them had brought luggage either. In fact, most of them were just like him. As Bishop Franklin approached the group, he recognized various faces other bishops, archbishops, and senior priests. With him there, they totaled seven. The others all looked at him, not saying much. Bishop Franklin tried his best to start asking questions, but two things happened in quick succession that closed his mouth very quickly. Firstly, the luggage hold of the plane was opened, and two enormous shapes were loaded into it via forklift. Each shape had unmistakable symbols on the sheets covering them. Nuclear danger. Reeling from this revelation, Bishop Franklin turned to the group to be face to face with the Pope himself. He immediately shut his mouth. You may also be wondering what on earth was going on at this airfield. The truth is, Bishop Franklin, along with six other priests of Abrahamic faiths, were about to embark on the monthly flight of SCP-616. Within this plane, as all these men were soon about to find out, exists an emergency door. Covered with satanic iconography, this door, when opened at ground level, operates just like any other emergency door, leading to the outside of the plane. Although any individuals who had passed through this door in this normal state reported feeling heightened anxiety during and after. However, once a month, this door will be anything but normal, opening a gate to, well, you'll soon see. In order to mitigate the threat posed to humanity through SCP-616-1, or the gate, the plane must be in the air at the time of its opening, far above and away from any human settlements. In order to keep this event contained, the door must be kept open for the duration of the portal's existence until it has closed of its own accord. But holding this door open is not a simple test of strength, it is a test of belief. In order to protect all of humanity from unknown horrors of a cataclysmic scale, seven priests of Abrahamic faiths must be on board for this monthly flight, praying for the door to remain open. The ability to keep the door open, it turns out, is unrelated to physical prowess, but instead is based entirely on one's own belief that the door can be held open. As such, religious figures praying to a higher power are incredibly well suited to the task. Once per year, the flight is blessed by the Pope, and every time the plane takes off, it must be holding two nuclear warheads in its hull. Both can be remotely detonated by the ground team, who will be in constant radio communication with the pilot. Should the pilot fail to give them regular updates on the status of SCP-616-1, the event will be treated as an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, and both nuclear devices will be detonated without hesitation. But Bishop Franklin only knew about half of this information from his redacted set of documents and had forgotten half of them on his stressful car journey. As he strapped himself into a window seat, he was trembling like a leaf. He desperately wanted to complain about being put into this situation, but he wasn't entirely sure who he would complain to. If he spoke to anyone external about what he was about to witness, he had been told by the Foundation agents that he would be administered with a Class C amnestic, whatever that meant. He really didn't want to find out. Fortunately for him, the most familiar of the faces from the group of priests sat next to him in the aisle seat. Bishop… Uh, what was his name? Sensing Bishop Franklin's uncertainty, the man reached a hand over and warmly reintroduced himself. Bishop Pete. They'd met two years ago in Berlin. Just that small action was almost enough to settle Bishop Franklin's nerves as the plane started to barrel down the runway. Almost. The plane took off, causing the old man's stomach to drop. Heart hammering, he looked around, spotting the emergency door. It was just up ahead of him, around the middle of the fuselage. It would have looked like a normal emergency exit, but for the blood-red markings scrawled across it. A wave of dread washed over him. It certainly looked evil, that was for sure. Trying his best to help, Bishop Pete struck up a conversation. He explained it wasn't his first time doing this. 
he'd been drafted to help three months ago. It was scary for sure, but everything was totally fine. The Foundation had planned everything to a T. It would have helped Bishop Franklin's nerves, but it only made his mind jump to the nuclear weapons he'd seen loaded into where his suitcase would have normally gone. The two of them lapsed into silence for a while. No one on the plane was really speaking. He supposed he should have used this opportunity to pray, but according to his briefing, he'd be doing a lot of that very soon. He hadn't entirely understood what the Foundation had meant by that. He'd been told to pray to, quote, keep the door open. What had they meant by that? A bang shattered the silence as the emergency door slammed wide open. In an instant, the plane went into a nosedive as all the air rushed from inside. The lights went out for several seconds, then came back on in flashing, panicked spasms. Bishop Franklin clung for dear life onto the back of the chair in front of him. As the roar of air rushed around him, it had gone dark outside with shapeless clouds swirling around him, shaking the plane. Screaming voices filled the aircraft, not just the voices of the men on board, but women and children too, crying out in agony and terror through throats that sounded like they'd been lashed with razor wire. Then he saw it. SCP-616-1. The gate was wide open. Smoke billowed out of it crawling along the floors of the cabin like an octopus creeping its way along the ocean floor. Red light seemed to spill out of it, but when he tried to look through the gate itself, it was like his brain wasn't working anymore. There were colors there, but there were ones he didn't recognize. Maybe they weren't colors at all. It was like his brain fixated on trying to sort them into something that made sense, something rational. A hand grasped his arm and he turned to see Bishop Pete staring at him with wild eyes. The plane was going down, they could both feel it, and that emergency door was slowly creeping shut. They had been brought onto this plane for one job only, to pray, like their lives depended on it. Bishop Franklin screwed his eyes shut and clasped his hands together. He hadn't prayed like that since he was a little kid, but he figured now was the time to use all the tricks in the book. He begged and pleaded in a tiny voice for God to keep that door open. It felt so counterintuitive, so backwards, to want to keep that kind of door open as the air roared and screamed around him. But a small voice inside of him told him to persevere, have a little faith. But suddenly, the bishop noticed that the man sitting alongside him had fallen silent. Feeling like a naughty child at mass, he opened one eye and peered sideways. Bishop Pete was still in his seat, but he'd slumped over. He wasn't breathing. His skin was cold to the touch, deathly cold. Then all of a sudden, his head rocketed backwards and he started talking. Not talking like a normal man, but talking like a man possessed. His dead eyes rolled around in his head aimlessly as guttural voices rasped out of his throat. None of them were the words that Bishop Franklin recognized. They sounded almost like Latin, but far darker and more ancient. And the more the dead man spoke, the more the emergency door closed. The bishop started praying again much harder this time, digging his fingernails into his palms so hard that he felt them drawing blood. He needed to keep this door open. He had to, and he could. He believed it entirely in that moment. The door banged back open wider than ever despite the chanting of the dead body in the seat next to him. Nightmares swelled to the forefront of his mind as the plane hurtled to the ground. Only, the plane wasn't hurtling to the ground. In fact, it was flying at a perfectly steady altitude of 10,972 meters, with an airspeed of about 780 kilometers an hour. In fact, aside from the death of Bishop Pete, everything within the plane was going perfectly to plan. Deaths of priests were just an occupational hazard of keeping this SCP contained. The pilot at the front of the plane regarded the whole situation playing out behind him while feeding constant information back to base. Everything was going perfectly according to plan, until the angel appeared. Bishop Franklin wasn't the first one to see it. That was the unfortunate lot of Archbishop Michael, who was sitting closest to the emergency door. He first spied it while staring through into the void, but his screams of terror warning those around him were drowned out by all the other commotion. It was only when the angel's wings crept their way through the edges of the door and the creature let itself into the cabin that the others saw it, but by this point, it was too late for Archbishop Michael. The angel was not like the angels we see in pop culture. A tall blonde person with white robes, fluffy wings, and a gentle face. 
It was a shifting mass of eyes and tortured wings, partially crawling along the ground, partially floating under the weight of its massive frame. It had to squeeze itself through the door to fit into the plane, but as it did, it lashed out at the Archbishop with a sinewy tendril and got to work violently killing him. That was when Bishop Franklin saw it and began to panic. He wanted nothing more than to stop praying, to let the emergency door slam shut and keep this creature away from them, but that little voice inside his head told him that wouldn't work. If that door was allowed to close before the gate had, then it would cause the apocalypse. He could not have that blood on his hands. So he prayed, sweat pouring down his face as the angel forced its way through the gate and into the cabin. He prayed as it slumped across the aisles, working its way along the line of men, slaughtering them one by one. He prayed as it saw him and rose to its full height, unfurling great wings and readying itself for the kill. And he prayed as a wind more powerful than any on earth blew through the cabin and pulled the angel back through the gate. The emergency door slammed shut, and in an instant, the plane seemed to right itself. No more turbulence, no more wind. The light flickered once more and then came back on steadily. The seatbelt sign pinged off, and oxygen masks dropped from the ceiling about four hours too late. Bishop Franklin couldn't believe the time when he looked at his wristwatch. He had been on this plane for weeks, surely, not just four hours. That was absurd. It all felt like a dream as the aircraft circled around the airstrip, preparing for landing. Everything in the plane seemed totally normal to him now. Except, of course, for the four dead bodies, one of which was slumped towards him in the aisle seat. The plane landed. The bishop staggered down the stairs and threw up on the blacktop. After a few awkward moments, the pilot sidled over to him and muttered a quick thanks. I was really close to calling it a failure there and having to set off them nukes. I don't know what you prayed for, but you did good today. Bishop Franklin didn't feel like he did good. He felt like he'd had his whole life, his whole worldview, turned upside down in the space of an interstate flight. He had been moments away from either being vaporized by a nuclear bomb, or from having economy seats to the premiere of the destruction of the world as we knew it. But just 31 days later, Bishop Franklin was on that same flight again, praying his hardest as the aircraft dropped into freefall. If there was one thing that the Foundation noticed about working with religious leaders, it was that they had a real determination to keep coming back to help keep the world safe. What the Foundation didn't have the heart to tell them was that all of the satanic markings on the door were actually fake. They had been added by researchers in an attempt to make SCP-616-1 carry more significance for those in the aircraft. Later testing revealed that it was not exclusive to Abrahamic faiths, or any faith groups for that matter, that they could keep the gate open. Anyone who believed they could do it was capable of it. Faith leaders, however, are still being utilized, and the blessing is still being performed by the Pope on a yearly basis. It had been found that these external rituals, while not necessarily directly impactful, have strengthened the belief and resolve of those inside the plane, yielding fewer casualties and shorter durations. Various experiments have been conducted to see beyond the event horizon of the gate, to see what's on the other side. Those in the plane have reported as having the name Paradise, despite never going inside. A remote-controlled rover was sent inside the gate on one experiment, but the footage was deemed far too dangerous as all those who witnessed it died within two months. Hopefully, you didn't peer too closely into the gate as you watched this video. It was July 2007, and the dry New Mexico heat could shrivel your average outsider into the size of a small keychain. Melinda and Bailey, two young women dressed in impeccable costumes of the Harry Potter characters Luna Lovegood and Hermione Granger, were getting ready for a momentous event. The release of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the final installment in the epic saga of the boy wizard and his quest to defeat the evil Lord Voldemort. They, like so many other cosplaying fans, had driven out to Page One Books, an exquisite bookstore in the very heart of Albuquerque. It was miles from where the two of them had lived, but more than worth the drive to be part of the Potterhead fever. Long before the series' author would lose her mind on Twitter and make the books a lot harder for most people to enjoy. Trans rights, by the way. Bailey and Melinda were counting the seconds until the bookstore's doors finally opened. 
and they could get the answers to so many of their burning questions. Why had Snape killed Dumbledore? Would Harry, Ron, and Hermione find and destroy the last few Horcruxes, allowing them to finally destroy Lord Voldemort once and for all? And most importantly of all, would their ships sail? Mel was Harry Hermione all the way, but Bailey, controversially, was all about Ron and Draco. The two of them couldn't be more excited to be part of literary history like this. The bookstore's doors opened and little by little, the line fed in. It was worth the long drive in the late evening and facing the sweltering summer heat. When the two of them were holding copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and walking back to their car, they knew it had all been worth it. Mel thought, this must have been how Jesus felt when he finished writing the first edition of the Old Testament. History, incidentally, had never been Mel's strong suit. Melinda and Bailey set off back to their homes in the sticks. Bailey was driving. She'd been kind enough to give Mel a lift, knowing they were probably their neighborhood's biggest Potterheads. It warmed their hearts to see all this enthusiasm for the book series they loved so fondly. Seeing so many others in costume, or with vinyl decals or bumper stickers in their cars declaring their love of the franchise. They'd seen Hagrid grabbing a mocha in Starbucks, Mad-Eyed Moody had been filling up his Buick at the Gas and Gulp, and Cirrus Black had passed out from heat stroke and needed to be attended to medically. With an all-black costume in this kind of weather, that much was basically inevitable. As Bailey and Melinda continued their drive, drawing closer to the witchy wilderness of Cibola National Forest, they continued sharing their thoughts, feelings, and predictions about the book to come. They couldn't wait to read it. Was it even possible for someone to be this amped about a book? Their enthusiasm was so great, they didn't even notice, on those long, winding back roads, that another car had started following them. It was 8.15 p.m. now, pitch black, the kind of darkness where bad things happen. Evidently, during a lull in the conversation, Mel turned her eyes up to the rearview mirror and spotted the car behind them. It was a car they'd recognize anywhere, a turquoise blue Ford Anglia 105E. To some, this would be a mostly unrecognizable, if a little old-fashioned car, but to Melinda and Bailey, it could only ever be the enchanted vehicle of Arthur Weasley, the father of series mainstay Ron Weasley. The car, which had become iconic since being featured in the books and films, was able to fly and turn invisible, and had gotten the main characters both into and out of a variety of amusing scrapes. Mel told Bailey to take a look, and she couldn't help but chuckle in admiration. Plenty of Harry Potter fans were in town tonight, and some took it further than others. At times, Bailey wondered if her three Harry Potter bumper stickers reading, My Other Ride is a Nimbus 2000, Save Gas, Take the Night Bus, and All Aboard the Hogwarts Express, respectively, were a little excessive. And then there was whoever this was, whose intense Harry Potter fandom led them to buy an authentic Harry Potter car. Neither Bailey nor Mel could make out the driver. The car's windshield was slightly fogged up. Strange. Strange, seeing as it was such a hot evening out. Mm. They noticed that the car also must have had broken turn signals, because any time the car needed to make a turn, the driver's arm would slide out the window and make the appropriate gesture. The Ford Anglia kept pace with them, following them at every single turn. It was only then that they noticed something a little odd. The car didn't have a license plate. It was almost as though all identifying features for the car or its driver had been obscured. Bailey, who was getting a little nervous at this point, decided to try out a little experiment. At the next three intersections, she took three left turns. It seemed improbable that anyone would actually intend to take a route that would lead them in a circle, and yet the Ford Anglia did just that. Bailey's most frightening suspicion was confirmed. They were being followed. She didn't need to tell Melinda, seeing as the bad vibes radiating off the car were already palpable. The two assessed their options. They couldn't drive home. After all, the last thing you'd want is a crazy person knowing where you live. Their best bet was to drive to a heavily populated area, say the center of Albuquerque during one of the most highly anticipated book launches in recent memory, or better yet, the local police station. Whoever was driving this car wouldn't dare try anything there. Bailey and Melinda sped up and took off in the direction of the city, but to their horror, the Ford Anglia sped up in kind. Bailey was pressing the gas pedal down to the floorboards, and still the Ford Anglia gained, its headlights glowing like menacing white eyes. In an instant, it pulled ahead of them, the driver's hand emerging once again. This time, it signaled for them to stop. 
The two of them would sooner drive their car off a cliff than stop for whoever was behind the murky front window of the Ford Anglia. As the Ford began to slow, perhaps hoping to box them in, Bailey pounded on the gas again and lurched forward, weaving around the Ford and passing it once more. Their two copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows were rattling around in the back seats. Neither Bailey nor Melinda expected this night to end in a car chase, but it wouldn't be the last time their expectations would be dashed before sunrise. The two Potterheads were in the lead again, but it would still be seven or eight miles before they were officially out of Cibola National Forest. Bailey drove as fast as she could. She and Melinda were frantic messes of terror and adrenaline now, but the Ford Anglia kept moving, gaining on them with every second that passed. Go faster, goddammit, faster! Melinda screamed in horror. I'm going as fast as I can! Bailey yelped back. The car merged into the lane next to them and sped forward again. They were neck and neck now, but it was still too dark inside the other car to make out the driver. Just as Mel was wishing that she could have a closer look, her wish was granted in the worst way possible. The Ford Anglia abruptly moved to the side and slammed against them, knocking them off course with a sudden shocking blow. The shock knocked Bailey sideways in the car and yanked the steering wheel along with them. The car veered off the side of the road and tumbled down the grassy embankment towards the trees, taking the two unfortunate Potterheads down with it. Before they knew it, their fender was wrapped around the trunk of a ponderosa pine tree. If it wasn't for their seatbelts and airbags, they would have died instantly. But perhaps in the end, that would have been a mercy. Melinda and Bailey sat up as the airbags deflated in front of them. The car was totaled. As the two of them shakily unbuckled their seatbelts and climbed out of the car, they were bathed in the light of the Ford Anglia's headlights from above, as though they were about to be abducted by a UFO's tractor beam. The Ford was just waiting on the road above them. Its engine rumbled like a low, bestial growl. The driver was still obscured behind the foggy windshield but their arm was hanging out of the window once more. Bailey and Melinda were too frightened and dazed by the crash to even move as the car began advancing with unnatural grace down the embankment before them. It clambered towards them with such uncanny intent that it seemed almost like it had a mind of its own, rather than a machine being piloted by a human being. Melinda pointed forwards and screamed. She saw something Bailey didn't. There was something on the outstretched palm of the driver's hand, she thought it was a tattoo at first until she saw it move. Two human eyes were fixed into the center of the flesh, staring directly at her, like a crustacean's eyes on stalks. Moments later, the car was upon them, and Melinda's scream was silenced. A concerned passerby found Bailey's abandoned car crashed in the ditch beside the road the next morning. The two women were never found, and two bashed-up copies of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows were discovered on the car's floor among all the shards of broken glass, never to be read. Some days can be magical, just not in the ways you would have hoped, especially if you run afoul of SCP-3470, a Euclid-class anomaly somewhat cruelly nicknamed Harry Potter's Revenge. Sadly, kidnappings and car accidents aren't that uncommon in this strange, scary world we live in, but at a certain point, the SCP Foundation's many field agents detected a strange pattern in a series of car accidents near Cibola National Forest in New Mexico. In all these instances, the cars had been found crashed, but there were never any bodies. Eagle-eyed police officers studying the crash also picked up another more subtle detail in all these events. The cars had turquoise blue paint chips on them, even if the cars themselves weren't blue suggesting the impact of another car. Foundation eggheads correlated this with another strange report they'd received out of New Mexico. A young couple had narrowly avoided a dangerous incident when a car matching the description of a classic Ford Anglia 105E tried to flag them down on a dark and lonely road near Cibola National Forest. Just like Bailey and Melinda, the duo were unable to see the driver behind the fogged up windshield. However, when they got close enough to see the driver's hand, they both attested that it had eyes on its palm, describing it as similar to the terrifying Pale Man from the movie Pan's Labyrinth. With all of these frightening and clearly anomalous data points in place, the SCP Foundation decided it was time to do their due diligence and go on the hunt for this predatory car. It wouldn't be the first time they'd tackled a sadistic or carnivorous vehicle, and because of this experience, they weren't going in unprepared. There was, of course, SCP-2086, also known as the man-eating bus. These were a species of huge insect-like creatures who'd evolved to perfectly mimic your average city bus in order to lure prey into their bodies. 
Another notable instance was SCP-1386, also known as the Living Ice Cream Van. This being is even more mysterious than the man-eating buses, and boasts a wide range of abilities from a hazardous form to a fleshy appendage somewhat similar to the arm emerging from SCP-3470. The jury's still out on whether either of these anomalies are in any way directly connected to SCP-3470, but it gave the SCP Foundation a few ideas on how exactly to engage, study, and potentially even contain this new vehicular slaughterer of man. As you've probably come to expect by this point, where there are still so many unknown variables involved, the Foundation decided to fall back on Old Faithful, throwing a couple of D-classes at it and just seeing what happened. Two were selected, placed in a standard Foundation off-road vehicle with dash and rear cams, and given a variety of equipment, including a special semi-automatic assault rifle with armor-piercing rounds, each one containing a micro-GPS that would allow the Foundation to continue tracking SCP-3470 after initial contact. And if, in the process of the experiment, SCP-3470 revealed some frightening new powers, then a standard vehicle and a pair of D-classes weren't much of a loss. Once again, another hapless duo were sent off on the roads in the proximity of Cibola National Park, though the Foundation hoped these two would at least end the night accounted for. They patrolled the roads, once or twice remarking on the beauty on the stars above, while not much of anything happened. Command kept close tabs on them back at the nearest containment site, feeding orders through earpieces and watching the live video feeds. As the drive continued, the two D-classes finally encountered SCP-3470. They get closer, at which point SCP-3470 begins its typical pattern of hunting behavior. It merged onto the road next to the D-class vehicle and began to slide alongside them. That's when the two D-classes realized, and couldn't help but remark, that this looked just like the car from Harry Potter. Was Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry a new group of interests now? Had Lord Voldemort entered into an allegiance with the Scarlet King? This was hilarious. Of course, it didn't remain all that funny to the D-classes for long. The anomalous Ford Anglia suddenly pulled up in front of them and ground to an abrupt halt, forcing the D-class driving to pound the brakes, startling both of them. That's when the human arm slithered out from the Anglia's open window and made the stop signal, before twisting around and revealing the two staring human eyes embedded in its palm. The D-classes started to panic and reverse away, while the car started chasing them at terrifying speeds. Foundation Command kept ordering the D-class riding shotgun to live up to his title and blast the vehicle with one of the tracking bullets, but the driver was so terrified, he refused to slow down and give his fellow D-class a clear shot. As a result, the armed D-class released a flurry of shots and just got lucky that some of them happened to strike the car. This caused it to let out a terrible pain shriek, comparable to the squeal of breaking car tires. SCP-3470 then retreated, allowing the D-Classes to safely return to base, while Command tracked the Ford Anglia back to its native habitat. It was time for the next phase of the mission to begin. The Foundation brought in Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, also known as the Pest Controllers, a group of operatives who specialize in taking down particularly verminous creatures. They'd be the ones to track down SCP-3470's nest, and find out what they were really up against here. In order to complete the mission, four members of the task force were designated for infiltration, while two others were designated to keep watch outside. The infiltrators were given reinforced armor and a wide selection of weapons and tools, including a flamethrower, a tranquilizer gun, a net gun, and a light machine gun. SCP-3470's movements were tracked back to a cave in Cibola National Forest. When the infiltration team entered, they saw track marks with a familiar tire tread on the floor and walls of the cave, which suggested a number of frightening things about the anomaly they were chasing. As they got deeper into the cave, the air became intensely hot and humid. They found scat piles filled with human bones and a local sheriff's badge, suggesting that the car does indeed eat and digest its prey. But most terrifying of all, the infiltration team discovered a number of translucent eggs, which had small quadrupedal organisms, assumed to be the larval stage of SCP-3470 wriggling away inside. They collected some of the eggs and then burned the rest before turning around to leave. That's when they noticed that SCP-3470 was in the cave mouth, waiting for them. Except this one wasn't turquoise like the other. This one was black. The car began revving aggressively, after a tense standoff in which one of the task force members muttered, I refuse to be killed by a goddamn Ford. The task force member with the light machine gun opened fire on the car's exposed arm, 
One of the bullets hit the creature in one of its hand eyes, causing it to let out another pain shriek and retreat from the cave mouth, allowing the task force to finally escape. The two who were meant to be on the lookout were never seen again. SCP-3470 remains at large, with the pest controllers doing whatever they can to track it down and contain it. The eggs are also subject to further study. In the meantime, be careful who you stop for, because if you end up inside this magical Ford Anglia, an encounter with the Whomping Willow is going to be the least of your worries. Now go check out SCP-1958 Magic Bus and Living Ice Cream Van SCP-1386 for more villainous vehicles from the world of the SCP Foundation.